All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Great. We're all awake. Nothing like a Spanish lunch, right? All right. Well, we've got an exciting program for you guys this afternoon. We're going to start with the future of tech talent, deep versus broad. This is a big discussion today. How do you train the technology people of the future? What's the role of emotional intelligence in all this? How technical do they need to be? The panel is going to talk about. And we've got the pleasure of having as moderator Manuel Muñiz, who's CEO of the Internet of Things Institute here in Spain. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's also a professor. Sí, es un empresario, también profesor en la IE Business School y mentor. Él va a moderar un panel compuesto por Chema Alonso, CDO de Telefónica, Pierre Dubuc, CEO de Open Classrooms y Lee Newman, el decano de la Escuela de Ciencias Humanas y Tecnología de IE. Por tanto, demos la bienvenida a Chema, Pierre, Lee y a Manuel. Yes, two of them are actually entrepreneurs and have been entrepreneurs at some point uh, in life. And two of them uh, have PhDs. The other one hasn't. He's too young, or maybe he wasn't born in Spain. Uh, but anyway, um, let's start with the panel. And um, uh, Chema, uh, Chema is the chief data officer of, of Telefonica. All of you know them. Um, he's also in, in charge of the big data study uh, of the company. He's been an entrepreneur with his company, um, Informatica Sista Equator, which then uh, was acquired by Telefonica. He's a PhD in computer security and computer engineering. So, Ingeniero informático. Y la primera pregunta para ti, Chema, es, con toda tu experiencia en el mundo tecnológico, Is it different how it's learned? Uh, what does the market um, actually uh, need or is asking for? Well, first of all, hello, Parker. How is it going? How are <laughs> you enjoying it? Yeah? Are you having fun? Yeah? Very well. Well, the truth is that I've been thinking all the time about uh, this afternoon panel. Um, when we were trying to discuss about the first question, I was trying to think exactly uh, what is the kind of thing that, that I believe about that? And it's, it's very complex. I think that today... Creo que hoy nos encontramos en un, mundo, en un mundo muy complejo. A día de hoy se necesitan varias habilidades en el mundo. Pero si pensamos en el mundo tecnológico, si pensamos solo en la tecnología, si pensamos en cuáles son las capacidades más útiles para crear tecnología o para ser disruptores, creo que lo más importante es tener capacidad de aprender, de que todo el mundo aprenda cosas nuevas cada día. Y cuando contratamos a personas nuevas, cuando contratamos tecnólogos para trabajar en nuestras áreas en Telefónica, es muy complejo pues encontrar a gente que tenga capacidades cognitivas de inteligencia, por ejemplo. Incluso la gente con más capacidades que sabe de infraestructura de Big Data, etcétera, Es muy difícil encontrar gente así. 
la tecnología evoluciona muy rápido y es difícil encontrar una persona que cumpla con todas las necesidades que tienes para la tarea que tienes que llevar a cabo en tu empresa. Así que intentamos encontrar gente con talento con, que tenga también la capacidad de aprender cada día para afrontar la, la, asuntos complejos, para, para entender lo que no se entiende al principio y, y para poner todo eso en práctica. Para mí es, esas son las aptitudes más difíciles que tenemos que encontrar y, y, y para mí las más importantes. Cuando empecé a aprender tecnología, yo tenía 12 años y lo único que necesitaba para aprender era BASIC, un, un lenguaje de programación muy común, y por, por ejemplo los hackers. Aprendían Assembler. Pero... Eso ha cambiado. Hoy hay muchas especialidades y necesitamos a gente que aprenda cada día. Porque así será como podamos crear tecnología disruptiva. La segunda pregunta es, bien, esto es un problema, que es complejo resolverlo en una hora. Pero quiero que pienses sobre este problema. Quiero ver si tienes ciertas capacidades o aptitudes para poder resolverlo o herramientas para resolver el problema. Esa es, esa es una pregunta que siempre hacemos en las entrevistas. Y si el candidato no nos muestra algo, lo que tiene que hacer es pensar en el siguiente paso para estar más cerca de resolver el problema. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Lee. ¿Cuál es la opinión de IE en este tema del talento tecnológico? Cuando pensamos en la tecnología... Take the department out, the marketing department. We've got somebody in the marketing department that's got some tech tools, you know, some business intelligence tools, for example. Um, so they're a user, and then you've got the IT department or the, the business intelligence department that might provide them with some tools. Um, but I think that that model doesn't really work anymore. Um, and I think the reason is, is because if you're in a function like marketing now, you need to have native digital skills. And when I say native digital skills, I'm not talking about you grew up with mobile devices and you know how to flip them. That, that's what we say native digital means. What I mean is you need to have innate abilities to think and work in digital and in analytics as part of what you do in marketing, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I think that <clears throat> that's on the, on the user side. And then you, know, you can have an IT department that's increasingly trying to be customer-centric and they go out to the, the business departments like marketing or finance or whatever. It might be, and they ask questions like, well, how can we give you the, the tech tools or analytics tools that you need? And so, having said that, then I'll make just three comments, three predictions in terms of implications. I mean, one is that I think someone who's in a business function and has primarily business training, um, I worry quite a lot about their future if they don't get these innate digital skills. Right? I worry quite a lot. I think they have to learn to think and work in digital, as I said before. And so on the, on the same side, I think people that are working
see is that the, the river needs to get narrower. We need to join the two banks closer together. And so in doing that, the, the second implication of, of what I mentioned, we see as being a massive need for people that we'll, I'll call bridgers, you know, or translators, or, or hybrids. I mean, people... Híbridos. Gente que hace ambas cosas, ya sean tecnólogos de la empresa o... Pero hace falta la mezcla de, de capacidades. Y lo último que diré es que si eh, cualquier empresa quiere conseguir talento que sepa de tecnología desde el... I mean, people who are good at the, some of the things you mentioned, reinforcement learning, or, you know, very deep learning, very narrow kinds of things that they're drilling down on. I mean, there's a clear over-demand now and a lack of supply because schools, I mean, this is, these are new fields. But I think we as schools are responding rapidly. I mean, we have degrees in all these things now in computer science and data science and, and so forth, and, and other schools as well. So I think the, the structural, the market problem of having too much demand for deep techies and not enough supply is going to lessen. Where I think that the, the war for talent is going to continue is for these bridgers, these translators, because it, it's not that we're not trying to train them, it's just, it's a very hard thing to do as a person. I mean, it's a cognitive thing. I mean, if you, how many people, how many of you think about your own, your own strengths and weaknesses? How many of you are able to, to dive deeply into math or into programming and at the same time sort of broaden your thinking outwards and understand business problems and the financials behind it, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a special person. And so I think that, that is always going to be a short supply. And we're trying to train more and more of those types of people. But the demand for them, I think, is enormous. OK, thank you. We'll, we'll pick up on, on some of the topics you mentioned later about this, this bridgers category, which I think is very interesting. But let me jump on to, uh, to Pierre. Pierre is a 29-year-old experienced entrepreneur. It's almost embarrassing to be sitting uh, beside him. Um, he is leading open classrooms. is an, an online campus which has um, um, over 3 million unique users per month and is in over 150 and um, 40 countries. Uh, probably no one better than you can tell us what's being demanded by the market now because you can uh, see immediately what people are um, um, are asking for in terms of, of, of training and also if people like it more or like it uh, less. Um, tell us on your experience, what, is, uh, what are the skills that are being demanded now? Um, are they deep tech uh, or are they bridge uh, skills, as uh, Lee was mentioning? Uh, and also tell us a little bit about this um, talent experiment which you are running in open classrooms, uh, which touches upon these issues which we are talking about here. Awesome. Thank you, Manuel. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Pierre Pierre. I'm, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Open Classrooms. I can give you a very short uh, overview of Open Classrooms to give you a bit of context. Um, so we started Open Classrooms five years ago as a mission-driven company whose mission is to make education accessible. Started this actually almost 20 years ago as a personal project in 1999 with my co-founder. We were 13 years old. I was 11 years old. We were in middle school and started to create online courses to help some friends. The very first course was on web development in HTML. Uh, published that online, it was like the easiest way to share it to friends, and then friends of friends started to uh, come along, and we built it and, and made this online community, this online learning community grow and grow. And after uh, more than 10 years doing so as a hobby, uh, we turned into um, a fast-growing, uh, mission-driven company. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Open Classrooms, and our aim is to uh, make professional education accessible. So education leading to jobs, to a better employability. So we try to uh, walk and tackle the skills gap, uh, the digital skills gap, um, which is quite interesting, because roughly a third of the jobs and competencies, as we know today, will be impacted by technology in the next 12 years, by 2030. So basically, it's a third of the global workforce that needs to be reskilled in 12 years. That's a billion people, OK? Uh, so billion people to be reskilled on digital skills, it's highly likely that uh, traditional education, like on-campus uh, college education, won't make it at that stage and at that scale. Um, so we created uh, this platform. Um, that in mind, um, we create and deliver fully online programs leading to degrees and jobs. 
So we try to link both of them, academic degrees, associate bachelor's and master's degrees, with competencies and jobs in high demand. So it's kind of a two-sided platform. We have students, we have employers, we train students, make them graduate, and then place them in the workforce, and we provide employers with talent, uh, with the competencies they, they need. And the cornerstone of the pedagogy is actually the competencies. So we need to design the programs in terms of competencies and sets of competencies and to provide the right competencies and to understand the competencies that are needed by employers. Can be hard skills, can be soft skills. I can, I can comment a bit more uh, on that. So right now we, we train, like you said, 3 million students a month on 60 different degree programs in uh, English, French, and Spanish in 140 different countries. Uh, we raised uh, $70 million. Uh, We're about 115 staff and 1,000 teachers. Um, so the, um, the teachers are either faculty or uh, mentors, so teaching assistants, professionals in the field, coaching 101 via video conference, every degree student. So it's highly personalized and high touch. And, and again, the goal, uh, the outcome is really the jobs and the competencies. So uh, we actually started working on a new product um, a, a year and a half ago uh, to really directly bridge the skills gap. So we have employers uh, with a talent shortage. They want to hire like data scientists, UX designers, and software engineers, or digital marketers, etc. And on the other hand, you have an employment program. You have job seekers. You have school dropouts. And Overall, you have also a lack of diversity and inclusiveness in the tech industry. So we started asking employers like IT services companies, like large banks, um, how many da data scientists um, do you want to hire this year? And the answer was like 200. OK, so what are the requirements uh, to hire a data scientist? So at first, the answer was, um, I want a graduate from uh, Stanford. Um, and we asked them, OK, do you know there are only 300 uh, graduates from Stanford every year uh, with that kind of set of skills? So even if you, 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 you hire like half of the entire university, you won't make it. Uh, so you need to have uh, to develop other hiring channels. So we took their others in, in terms of jobs, competencies, so I want to hire 50 data scientists in Madrid, in Berlin, in New York, with those competencies. And then we created a company tailored curriculum, a degree program. We then um, found students, we pre-qualified them, and then they went through the employer's hiring process. And they were hired by the employer from day one. So we started with Capgemini, a global IT services company. And they hired those new students from day one. So it's not a job at the end. It's really a job from day one. They were not data scientists yet, or developers, or whatever job. They were on their way to become. Um, and we sourced them. We pre-qualified them on technical prerequisites, but also their ability to learn. Uh, and the first kind of learning analytics we found about them on our own platform. Like they went through a couple of different courses, and then uh, we selected them. And they, uh, they have a work contract from day one. They have a salary from day one. And they have the work and study program, apprenticeship program. Um, so it means tuition fees are covered by the company. It means they work for four days a week in the company, and they are trained one day a week uh, on open classrooms. And the projects that they will work on inside the company will actually be assessed academically and provide credits uh, that will uh, validate their degree. Um, and they will graduate in like 12 to 18 months. They'll have a job, they'll have a degree, et cetera, et cetera. So this product has been a tremendous success. Um, uh -huh. We deployed new cohorts uh, in many different uh, companies. Um, so it's, it's really interesting because it's like completely a win-win situation for everybody involved. Um, but the challenge we face now is to make sure that employers also change the way they think um, how they recruit. 
and not based on just degrees, but uh, they need to think of the jobs and the competencies behind the jobs that are actually needed. When you, when you think of competencies, you can then widen your talent pool and you can get into alternative degrees or other kinds of degrees. You can get into apprenticeship and you can have a more diverse and inclusive um, way of hiring. So this is the main challenge we are facing. So how do we change the recruitment pipeline with employers? Yep. I mean, uh, recently there was uh, this news that uh, high tech companies like IBM and Apple uh, and Google uh, were not using the university degree barrier anymore to hire uh, tech talent because there were so many alternative ways to, uh, to acquire these skills, or maybe because uh, current uh, training uh, is not fulfilling these, uh, no. these needs. I mean, build, building upon what you, what you previously said, um, uh, Lee, I mean, and, and for the sake of the discussion, we could simplify uh, the world into non-talent or non-tech non talented people, no. deep tech talented people, and those, those bridge, you know, tech talented people which are, which are in the middle. Um, recently, you know, former CEO of General Electric, um, Jeff, Jeff Immelt, he said that everyone in the company, over 70,000 employees, would need to know how to code in a few years. Um, is that extreme view? I mean, would, would you apply that to bridge talented people and non-tech talented people, or, or only to tech talented people? I mean, what are the skills that everyone is going to need to have? Also, please, Jim, I'd like to have your view in Telefonica in the coming years. Uh, so my answer uh, would be yes. I think that certainly the, the bridgers all need to learn how to code. I would argue that the people that you're calling the non-tech talent also need to do it um, because I think it, it's, a, it's a fundamental building block. I mean, it's sort of like saying, I'm going to work in finance, but I'm not going to know how to use Microsoft Excel you know, in the old days. I mean, you have, to, you have to understand how computation works to work in digital because fundamentally that's what it's, what it's about. Now, my caveat would be that I think the way coding is happening might change, right? And so we're seeing a lot of changes in terms of plug and play and in terms of point and click. So I mean, things that I tried to do in, with neural networks when I was doing my PhD, I had to code everything I did by myself. But now I, mean, I could just fire up you know, an environment and have some plug and play tools to do it all yeah. in, in one one hundredth of the time. And so if that happens to coding, then I think the, the barrier, the, the sort of um, the difficulty or the sphere that a lot of people have in learning to code goes away. Because now if I can construct, let's say, a computational engine that I need to, to do something, whether I'm in marketing or finance or whatever, wherever I may be working, if I can do that in a way that doesn't quite require the depth that the deeper techie or the translator might have, then I think everybody needs to know how to do that. And I don't think we're far from, from that point. Tema, what's your view? <clears throat> well, I have a, an interesting story about that. Probably we, most of the people don't know that uh, before I got into Telefonica, uh, our actual president uh, told me, you need to get into Telefonica. And I said, no, not at all. I've never been into Telefonica. And <laughs> before I said yes, <laughs> I was teaching, teaching him every Friday in the afternoon uh, how to hack hacking techniques, how to code, etc. So today, if any of you have the opportunity of going to our president office, you can see that there is a, an Amstrad computer with a basic manual because I, I gave it to him to learn how to code because our president want to know, wanted to know how to code and, and he was learning how to code because for Telefonica, which is a technology company, is a, a very important requirement. And we were analyzing how, uh, how, uh, what were the gaps that we had in, into Telefonica. And I remember that when in Telefonica we launched Waira, which was a very, a very big bet for Telefonica, trying to open innovation to third party, to entrepreneurs, to tech, uh, tech people that appear with different point of view, different ideas, etc. I was invited to visit Waira. And at that moment, uh, I was asking to all the entrepreneurs about their ideas, how is the project they were building up, etc. And after finishing that, I remember that I was a uh, question about my point of view of the startups. And I remember that I said, okay, I see a lot of Steve Jobs 
a few steed, and few Steve Bodniaks. And, <laughs> and the president, our actual president, told me, who is Steve Bodniak? And I said, OK, that's the problem. We need Steve Bodniak into Telefonica. And we created a program, which is Talentum. Some people of Talentum is still here, is, is in, in the room. And the idea of Talentum was very aligned with that vision. We were looking for young people, not with the degree uh, finished, just brilliant people with deep tech knowledge about the new technologies with uh, a new way of using technology. It, this, uh, it uh, didn't matter at that time if you have a university degree or, or, or not. And we were hiring a lot of people. And today we have internally in our team, I don't know, more than 100 people coming from that program, from that Talentum program. And at the beginning, uh, they were young people with no degree. Some of them never finished the, their degree. Some of them are still studying in the university. And for us, it's important to open that way of hiring people with uh, tech talent, because if not, it's completely impossible to, to fulfill all the vacancies that we have. Yeah. I mean, could I, could I infer or could one infer from uh, your statement now and from Pierre's uh, previous one that the most valuable uh, players or the most valuable talent right now in the eyes of the companies are the deep talent uh, uh, guys? Is that, is that the case or not? Because on, contrary to that vision, uh, Jack Ma recently in a World Economic Forum uh, speech he said that all these tech skills were going to be overtaken by machines and that we should be teaching people you know, um, how to love, how to take care of others, integrity. But I listen to you guys, and it appears that companies are looking for hardcore tech people. Um, so I, I, I personally think that um, educational providers, universities and schools, um, should right now create what we call T-shaped profile, so shaped like a T. So it means a horizontal basis of general education, meaning soft skills, critical thinking, learn how to learn, uh, work as a, as a team member in the team, um, creativity, leadership, these kind of things. And actually, when you talk to employers, they do think it's very important to them. They're, they're not just thinking uh, of you know, Python and, and data, data science and digital marketing. They're also thinking of, you know, I need decision maker, I need leaders, etc. So this is the basis, the kind of horizontal way um, you have to uh, think of that. And then you have this like, deep vertical uh, understanding and knowledge, uh, which is my specialization as a data scientist, or project manager, or a business analyst, or an accountant. Uh, and I think you need both. Uh, I do think also it varies um, depending on your level, your current level of education. Um, we deal from you know, um, school dropouts with no uh, high school diploma, or even middle school diploma, up to PhDs uh, from MIT or Oxford. Uh, and I can ensure you that whenever you're unemployed for five years, you don't have a high school diploma, you don't have a college education, you're not looking for general education right now. You're looking for a job. You're looking for the shortest training program, the hard skills needed to have a first job, and then you can move up the ladder. Um, but I think we need also not to think just of you know, master's degrees and Ivy League type uh, education. We, we need to think of um, the people left on the side of the workforce right now. How can we bring them back um, in the workforce and on a learning path that will take years but can get you to the top? Oh. I was just going to add, um, yeah. I agree 100% with the idea of the, of the T. And in fact, for, for example, we have a bachelor in data science where they spend the entire first year doing liberal arts and sciences to build critical thinking, leadership, behavioral skills, yeah. etc. Um, I might update it a little bit to say that if we keep the, uh, the alphabet analogy, I'd make it an F rather than a T <laughs> in the sense that I think... <laughs> Um, based on what I said earlier, that, that the bridgers or the translators are going to be in more demand, not now, but in the future. Um, maybe drill a little bit less down the T and then drill across, go across a little bit, you know, to make it an F in the sense of being broad enough in tech, especially at the bachelor level, to not just be so deep that if, if that particular hole where you've drilled down 
disappears because it's either been automated or technology has changed, you're broad enough to then adapt and be agile, yeah. as, as Gemma was saying early, sure. earlier, learn how to learn, and you have that broader basis to do that. So I think it's a mixture of deep, broad, with the, the cap of liberal arts and yeah. science foundations. Okay. And, um, um, and how do you keep up? I mean, this, this uh, touches upon uh, this learnability concept which you mentioned in the beginning. I mean, things are evolving rapidly. Uh, you know, knowledge becomes obsolete also very rapidly. So in order to keep up from a co in a company, you need to kind of you know, recycle talent all the time. And also that poses a huge challenge uh, for educational institutions uh, because you need to update content and, and your educational proposal. And, and that, uh, I mean, does that affect your model? And does that affect you know, profitability? Because in, it's always easier to industrialize you know, content and sell it for a, for, for a short, long period of time. But that cannot be done any longer, right? So, First, from your perspective, Chema, from a corporate, how do you um, go about keeping up you know, with tech talent? And from your educational perspective, how do you, uh, you know, make it possible to recycle and update your value proposition to, to students? In, internally, <clears throat> internally in, in our team, the, the tech talent is, is very important. Um, I need to say that in the chief data officer, uh, more than half of the people are t just technical talent and the other are focusing different business units. So it's, it's the, the most, uh, the biggest area is the technical part, which is CTO internally. Mm -hmm. And we try to create a culture about that. We, we do a lot of, of things. We, we, uh, we have people trying to tech the rest of the people how to learn how to use all the, the tools that we have. Today is wonderful. We have internet with all the resources that you need it, online courses, books, whatever you need it, videos, conferen conferences, talks, etc. And, and, and internally, we have a lot of activities try to, to spread that culture. We have hackathons internally. We have short times uh, of production with extra time for your own time, you can do and learn whatever you have. We have innovation areas, so you, if you uh, want to learn something, you can move to an innovation area for a time and then go back to your product team and working with, with uh, the rest of the people you are working normally. We have a very uh, flexible structure in which someone can be moved from one product to another, one project to another project from one day to, uh, to another day, etc. But the most important is the culture. You need to have that culture internally in, in the company. If not, if you are doing something ad hoc, every time that you have a problem uh, with technology, you are, you are doing wrong things because it's not part of the DNA that you need in your team. OK, thank you. Uh, Lee, and then Pierre. Um, I would say that it doesn't affect our model, but it affects the process by which we execute our model in yeah. the sense that keep, keeping up to date requires that we go out to companies constantly and talk to them and say, what do you need now? And, and the technologies or the skills, the competencies, as you called them earlier, Pierre, I mean, the, the competencies that they need change really rapidly. So right now, we might be doing Hadoop and Python and Tableau, but you might tell us, no, 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 we've moved on. You know, we're in the process of changing. We need X, Y, and Z in the future. And so we have to change it. And that means that puts a lot of pressure on us in the sense of it might be a different professor. I mean, maybe we stop teaching Python and we start teaching, uh, I don't know, Julia or something. And, and so now we've got to find a, probably a new professor. So for, for us, it makes us have to be quite agile and move quickly. Um, it also for us means that to stay current, um, you guys have both mentioned the idea that I, the label I would put on it is lifelong learning. Uh, and so you can get a bachelor's or a master's, but that's laying the bricks, the foundations, I think. And so to stay up to date, I mean, you can't keep doing master's degrees. You need something, you need smaller Lego blocks to put in there. And so we actually, at, at, at IE University, we have a whole unit that we call exponential learning. And the idea there is that, you know, you've got to be exponential and fast, and you've got to keep updating. And so the combination of degree programs and and smaller bricks that you add to yeah. your foundations is, is the way that, that we see it. So it's not a different model, but it, it makes us change our processes quite a bit. Thank you. Pierre, quick last word on that one. So neg it affects negatively uh, our financials in the way that we need to maintain the programs. At least 20, 25% of every program will be ditched and recreated every year on digital scale. So that's quite of an investment. 
Um, so it affects the, the processes, and you need to be more, be more agile. More positively, um, for universities, it can be really opportunities, because in, in, instead of having providing just like this four-year bachelor's program between 18 to 24, then you'll be able to provide several times in, uh, in their uh, lifetime uh, new programs. So you know that a, a graduate right now um, in, in, in Europe, when they graduate, they know that they're going to probably experience between 10 to 15 different jobs in their lifetime, in their career. So they will switch careers at least, at least 10 times. So as a university, you can be there for them. You can, there, you can help them convert and switch careers 10 times. Uh, and sometimes by small blocks, sometimes with a stronger, deeper program. So it means more revenue overall, because you can resell uh, to your graduates and to your alumni. So I think overall, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, for educational providers. Thank you. OK, we're running out of time. Uh, just to wrap up, we've spoken here about learnability, uh, about different types of profiles which uh, will be needed in the future, T profiles, F profiles. Uh, we can split uh, the talent in categories of the breachers, the deep, talent, the deep tech talent people, and the non-tech talented people. Um, what is clear is that uh, staying still is not an option. Uh, we are in the era of li lifelong learning. Thank God we have alternative sources of learning. We have online courses. We have um, you know, um, uh, courses uh, like IE. And then you have you know, people who learn by themselves, li like Chema. So I tend to think that the future <laughs> is a mixture of, of all these uh, sources yeah. of knowledge. And above all, it's learning by doing. So thank you very much. Give them a warm uh, hand towards us. That's it. Thank you. Got it, Joan. All right. OK, we got some more seats up the front for some of you that can't find seats in the back there. Just a, uh, an, one quick announcement. Dean, president of IE University, Santiago Iñiguez, is going to be signing copies of his book at 4.30. OK. So let's talk about our next guest. Our next guest is somebody truly unique. As you heard earlier, tech training is changing today. And the reality is that innovation is changing. Much of innovation today has to do with the user experience. And this company that Duncan Wardle has been working for for the last 10 years is an expert in user experience. They are the model of user experience. They've bought many companies 
and as Amazon and so many others, they're leading the way in innovating by acquiring startups. And that's why this company and this gentleman is so perfect for this audience here today. Because Disney is a company that has been one of the leaders, not just in innovation, but in education. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Duncan Wardle. Good afternoon. Um, if I could, by a show of hands, I'd like you to put your hand up if you consider yourself creative. Who here is creative? This is good. OK, that was probably less than 10% of the audience. So I'm going to ask the question again, only a slightly different way. Put your hand up if you were a child once. This is not a trick question. I'm always amazed how long it takes people to put their hands up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to uh, stand up in just a minute. And um, just stand next to the person next to you and choose who's going to be person A and who's going to be person B. Up you get. <clears throat> okay, so. Let me have you back. Person A, I'm going to give you, let me have you back. Person A, I'm going to give you your chosen career. You have worked in this occupation for the last 25 years. Nothing that you say is wrong because you're the world's leading guru on this particular topic. Person B will play the role of a news reporter and interview you for one or two minutes about the job you've been doing for the last 25 years. Person A, for the next two minutes, for the last 25 years, you've been the world's leading designer of parachutes for elephants. Person B will now interview you about that job. Off you go. All right, let me have you back. So um, we're going to change roles. So now person B, it's your turn. Uh, let me see. Person B, for the last 20, and person A will interview you about your chosen career. Person B, for the last 25 years, you've been the world's leading sex therapist for honeybees. Off you go. <laughs> All right, take a seat, please. So uh, for those of you who thought you weren't creative when you came in, I would argue that you just proved yourself wrong. Um, so who am I and why am I here? My name is Duncan. I worked for the Walt Disney Company for 30 years. I started as a barman in uh, Epcot in 1986. I went back to London. I became the cappuccino boy for the London office. There were six people in Disney in 1986. There's now 2,500 in London. And I grew up through the ranks of public relations. And I got to do all the crazy things. I got to build uh, an Olympic-sized swimming pool down Main Street, USA, for Michael Phelps to swim down. I got to, uh, got to put ears on a Concorde. Um, <laughs> I got to send, this, this is a real photograph, this is not a fake photograph, that really is Buzz Lightyear, he really is a toy, he really is my son's Buzz Lightyear. And that picture was taken on the International Space Station, uh, and if you notice, NASA 
were kind enough to wait until they got over the state of Florida, which is where James lives, to take the picture. Um, and now he resides in the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, DC. So I was the guy who did all the crazy things for 20 years. And 10 years ago, probably like many people in the audience, I got a call from the chairman. It's never good, is it, when you get a call from the chairman? It's never the call that, hey, you're doing a great job. He said, look, you're the guy with all the big ideas. You're in charge of innovation and creativity. Well, what the hell is that? Does it come with a job, a brief, a job description, a team? Don't know. Go figure it out. So the first thing I did, we, we surveyed 5,000 people at Lucasfilms, Pixar, Marvel, uh, ESPN, ABC. What were the barriers to being more innovative and creative at work? And we found five. Number one, still the number one barrier to innovation, time. If I to, were to look at your diaries for next week, on Monday, I know what your diary already looks like. It looks, looks like the barcode on a packet of cereal. It's completely full. And you hear yourself say, I don't have time to think. It's a massive barrier to innovation. Number two, risk averse. We have quarterly results. Companies who stay focused on their quarterly results will be gone in less than 10 or 15 years. Because everybody's watching artificial intelligence every, at the moment. I met Sophia in Colombia last week. She is um, scheduled to be or, uh, the world's most uh, intelligent artificial intelligence robot. They say she will be 5,000 times more intelligent than the human race by 2025. So we're right to be focused on artificial intelligence. But it's a wonderful gathering today of companies and entrepreneurs and startups. But why do we see this rise of entrepreneurs and startups? Why is this huge new ventures of, uh, of entrepreneurs and startups? Because the generation that's coming underneath the millennials as well, Generation Z, and this is a trend most people are not watching because they're watching artificial intelligence and they're watching big data and they have every right to focus there, but they're not focusing over here. Generation Z, a generation that cares more about purpose than profit. And if you care more about profit than purpose, they will make you go away in less than 15 years from now. Most companies have lost their way. They've worked from 1900 to 2010. We build it, they will come. Disney Parks, Ford, Coca-Cola. We build it, they will come. Five years ago, that model got turned on its head. And changing a product-centric, we build it, they will come culture to a consumer-centric, a culture focused on the consumer, what's important to them, is very difficult for a lot of people because they're focused on their quarterly results, because we've always been focused on our quarterly results. And a company without a purpose in the next 10 or 15 years, this generation will make, we've seen Kodak go, we've seen Blockbuster go. No, no, no. <laughs> There's going to be 10,000 gone in the next decade because they refuse to change. They refuse to innovate. Um, ideas get stuck, diluted, or killed as they move through the organization is a big one. Consumer insight is being underused. That's a polite way of saying it's being ignored. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever spent a full day in the house of one of your end users or consumers for a whole day? Okay, we're at five. That's not good, people. So, te 10 years ago, I was Executive Vice President of Global Public Relations for Disney. I was too important to spend a day with a consumer. Why would I possibly do that? They are but mere mortals. I am but a god. I have a cappuccino machine and an assistant. The insights for innovation that I learned from simply getting out of our big data, get, and by the way, big data is going to get better, faster, and more intuitive, but our consumers will still be human. And so simply by spending a, a time with your end users, you'd be amazed at what insights for innovation you can get. And I'm going to share an example of that with you now. The last one was we had no common definition of innovation or creativity. By its own interpretation, creativity is open to interpretation, but everybody has a different definition. And that's good unless you're trying to change a culture. And then you need one. So we created one definition, the habit of continually doing things in new ways to make a positive difference to our working lives the habit of continually doing things in new ways to make a positive difference to our working lives. What one word in that definition stands out to you? I know it's the after lunch lot. <laughs> what one word in that definition stands out? Continually? Habit? 
It's about making it a habit, right? Used to be like my French. I was fluent in French. I worked in Disneyland Paris for three years. Now when I go back to France on holiday, it's a sandwich de jambon, s'il vous plaît, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, because it's the only thing I can remember how to order. But it is about making a habit. So I'm going to invite you to sit back in your chairs for just a minute and fold your arms. So how does that feel? Man, you lot are a conservative bunch this afternoon. <laughs> Comfy, maybe? Closed for some people? Give them a shake. Now I'd like you to fold them the other way. How does that feel? Awkward. Whose arms are they anyway, right? They feel like dead people's arms? You can let them go, it's okay. That's how innovation feels. It feels different. If it doesn't feel different, you're not innovating. The science of your brain says if you fold and unfold your arms um, the wrong way, 30 times a day, four days in a row simultaneously, you will rewire your brain to fold your arms the other way. So you can, in fact, learn new habits, even at my ripe old age. But um, who are the most creative people that you know? Yes, children. Usually about this tall now. Remarkable imagination. I gave my nephew a bicycle for Christmas when he was six. It was uh, uh, the Lightning McQueen bike. Cars had just come out of the movies. It came in a huge box with wrapping paper and ribbon. It took a while to get the bike out of the box. <sighs> what did he spend the rest of the day playing with? Why? Why the box? Because it could be anything he wanted it to be. It could be a rocket ship, pirate ship, a fort, a castle. When was the last time you saw the rocket ship? First day you entered school, your teacher said, no, it's a box. Imagination, creativity, shut down. Then we go to work and people say, there's only one right answer. So we stop looking for the second right answer. Um, Einstein once said, I'm not particularly clever, I'm just remarkably curious. Think about your curiosity as a child. What question do they ask? Why? And the question after that? And the one after that? <laughs> Why, right? They, that's how they learn. Education and corporate life teaches us there's only one right answer, so we stop asking the second why. If you ask a consumer, why do you go to a Disney park? They'll say, oh, I go on the rides. Okay, well, if I stop there, I'll build more rides. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. But if I asked why a second time, why, why do you like the rides? Oh, well, I love Small World. Well, why do you love Small World? Well, because I used to go with my mother. Well, why is that important? Ah, well, now I go with my daughter, and I'm building memories. You're like, well, hang on a minute. That is not a capital investment product. That is a communication challenge. But if you stop at the first why, you truly don't get to the deep insight. Um, if, you, if you do focus groups and invite in individuals, you don't really get insights. You get insights out of couples. If you put a couple together, they will police each other. So if you ask the father, what do you do when you go to Disney? He'll say, I play golf and I drink beer. So then we build more golf courses and more bars. But if his wife is sitting next to him, she's going to go, uh-uh, no, you did Small World 17 times back to back last year and really loved it. So suddenly you start to get a real insight just out of spending time with couples. Children think expansively. Anything is possible. How might we? We think reductively. How can we? Because education and experience teaches us that to think reductively. If you want to innovate, you need to be expansive. You need to think like a child. So what do children do better than anybody else? They play, right? That's what they do. And they're very good at it. Who here is encouraged to be playful at work? Anybody encouraged to be playful? One, one person encouraged to be playful at work. Um, may I invite you for just a moment to close your eyes? And I'm going to get down because I can't get any participation from up here. So um, keep your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want you to think about the answer. I just want you to shout the answer out. Where are you usually and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Shower. Shower. Gym. Sleeping. Sleeping? Oh, swimming. Before sleeping. On a plane. Walking. Playing football. A large glass of Rioja. Nobody? A large glass of OK. So um, it doesn't matter how long I ask that question for or to how many people, 
You never hear the following two words. At work. That's not good, right? You're paid to have big ideas at work, right? So close your eyes again. I want you to picture in your mind's eye the last verbal argument that you had with somebody. You don't have to tell anybody about it, so you can be as honest with yourselves as you choose to be. Once you can see that argument, I want you to open your eyes so I know you can see it. Tell so the argument's over. You're angry at Fred. Fred, you son of a bitch, you blind copied my boss on that email. You threw me under the bus, I'll never work with you again. You storm out of the office, you slam the door, you're really angry, you're furious at Fred. It's about five minutes later, you get to your local coffee shop, you sit down, you get a cappuccino. Five minutes after the argument's over, you're beginning to relax. What just popped into your head? Just pops in. You didn't even ask for it. The killer one-liner you wished you'd used during the argument. The perfect line. Or if I'd have said that. Oh, I'd have had him. That would have been the perfect line. Ooh, the perfect line. Nowhere to go with the perfect line. What a disaster. You've got the, you could write a book of perfect one-liners, no? Have you ever delivered it during the argument? No. Always five minutes afterwards. Why? Your brain in an argument is defending itself. And it looks like this. And it, you hear yourself say, I don't have time to think. Your brain in the office, guess what? Looks exactly the same. I'm doing an email. I'm doing a presentation. I'm listening to somebody. I'm talking to somebody. I'm scheduling a diary. I'm getting on an airplane. And I say, I don't have time to think. And when I don't have time to think, I can't come up with a big idea like the shower, and I can't come up with that killer one-liner that I could come up with when I'm in the shower. And so being playful, you don't need to be playful every minute of every day, but you do need to be playful when you want to have big ideas. What, why do you have to be playful when you want big ideas? Because only 13% of your brain is conscious. The other 87% is subconscious. This is what your brain looks like, by the way. I don't know if you... So 13% <laughs> conscious, 87% subconscious. You only work with 13% of your brain 95% of the day. You get to work, you commute, you write emails, you say the right thing, you go to meetings. But 87% of your brain goes unused. Every bicycle ride you've ever been on, every place you've ever visited, every person you've ever kissed, even the ones you choose to forget that pop up on Facebook a few years later, they're all back there to, as unrelated stimulus for you to have new ideas. But you can't access your subconscious brain when you're stressed. You can only access your subconscious brain when your brain is relaxed, when you're in the shower, when you're walking, when you're running the dog. That is the spirit of being playful when you need to. A couple of people said I get my best ideas when I'm going, falling asleep or waking up. Do you know the expression when the penny drops? It's that, whoa, I've got a big idea. It's Eureka. Came from Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison used to fall asleep at night on an armchair. He would put a penny between his knees, and as he fell asleep, his muscles would relax. The penny would drop to a tin tray. He would wake up and write down whatever he was thinking. And you can think, OK, that's mad. I would never do that. Well, he had more inventions uh, patented in the 20th century than anybody else. Dali, same thing. He would fall asleep against his easel. As he fell asleep, he would fall over. He would wake up and sketch whatever he was dreaming. Of course, I want to know what he was smoking before he went to bed. But he was not an unsuccessful artist. But for most of us, as we grow up, we think more reductively. We have less tools to play with. The more experience you have and the more expertise you have, the more reasons why you know why something won't work. I call it your, uh, your river of thinking. Your river of thinking. 20 years, Disney public relations. How fast, how wide, and how deep do you think my river of thinking is on Disney and public relations? Very fast, very deep, very wide. It's impossible to cross a very wide, very deep, very fast flowing river. And the more experience you get, the more reasons you know why something won't work. And you immediately go to no, no because, rather than considering yes and or how might we. So we developed a series of tools to help get you out of your river of thinking, because it's not easy. Um, if you had a pen and a piece of paper, I'd try an experiment with you, but I'm not sure how many people, how many people have a pen and a piece of paper? Okay, I'm gonna try an experiment with you then. So, I'm gonna name an object. 
And I'm going to give you seven seconds to draw that object. Listo. OK. I would like you to draw a house, una casa. Siete, seis, cinco, cuatro, tres, dos, uno. Pens down. Now I want you to hold up your house and show it to the person sitting next to you. So, I have a few questions for you. Why is the door always in the middle at the front? Why two windows? Why do the windows always have crosses on them? What shape is the roof? Triangle, sure it is, of course it is. Why? Because my river of thinking, my river of experience, my river of expertise tells me that's what a house should look like. I want to talk about diversity and the power of diversity, or as I said in the last slide, a naive expert. A naive expert is somebody you should bring into every session you're running. There's only one qualification. They do not work for you, they do not work in your industry, they don't look like you and they don't think like you. Most corporations value diversity for political correctness and it's rubbish. We have to have our quota, otherwise somebody might sue us. What they failed to realize, and I was guilty, was diversity is innovation. People who don't look like you don't think like you and they will make you think differently. So we were designing a new retail dining and entertainment complex for Hong Kong Disneyland. We had all the Imagineers in the room from Disney, white, male, 50, all of them. I asked them to draw a house. That's what I got. But I also invited in the executive chef from Hong Kong Disney, female, less than 30, Chinese. She drew dim sum architecture, which if you've never seen it before, and I had not, was a round dim sum bamboo dish with a pork ball, a prawn ball, a chimney, and some steam coming out of the chimney. When we held our pictures up, everybody laughed because we realized we'd stayed in our river of thinking of what architecture should look like. She gave us permission to get out of our river of thinking and think differently, to consider audacious architecture. On the way out of the room, somebody put a sticker over her picture. It said, distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Seven years later, the strategic brand positioning for the Shanghai Disney Resort, distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. The naive expert's role is not to solve your challenge for you. It's to ask the embarrassing question that you're too embarrassed to ask in front of your colleagues. It's to throw out the audacious idea that you're too conservative to throw out in front of your peers. That will get you to a different place. And it, it works pretty much every single time. So I would encourage you, if you're not a diverse organization, or even if you are a diverse, look out. In, innovation comes from looking outside of your industry, not inside of your industry. Um, what if? How many people here have rules at work? To the nearest 10,000. Wait, only 10% of you have rules? This, well, you won't need this tool. Um, so, Walt Disney created, who went to see Fantasia? Anybody been seen Fantasia? Okay, so, when Walt created Fantasia, it was 1940. Walt was such a visionary, he wanted it to mist inside the theater during drip, 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 little April showers. He wanted heat pumped in during night on a bare mountain. And the theater owner said, too expensive, Walt. We're not going to do it. So Walt used this tool. Step one, list the rules of your challenge as quickly as you can. Movies, it's dark, it's dirty, I have to go at a set time, I have to watch the previews, I have to sit next to the sun. By the way, 1940 and 2018, there's an industry that could do with a little innovation because it hasn't moved in 64 years. Um, but he listed all the rules. One rule that he took, that he chose to break, was um, I, can't, I, Walt Disney, can't control the environment. So he said, what if I could? Well, that wasn't very provocative. So he said, what if I took my movies out of the theater? Well, that's a provocative question. So he said, well, imagine a world where I could actually make that work. Well, OK, if I took my movies out of the theater, they can't be two-dimensional anymore because they'd fall over. Well, then I'd have to make them three-dimensional. Well, if I make them three-dimensional, well, I can't have Cinderella living next to Captain Jack Sparrow because people wouldn't be immersed in the story. So Cinderella would need to live in a different land. Well, I'll have to create different lands. 
Well, if I create dis dis different lands, what, 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 what do I call it? Oh, yeah, I know. I'll call it Disneyland. Who here used to go to um, Blockbuster Video? Okay. Reed Hastings, who founded Blockbuster, had $130 worth of late fees on Apollo 13. He listed all the rules of going to Blockbuster. You have to drive there. You have to be kind of rewind. You uh, could only get three. You never got the one you wanted on opening day weekend. You, know, you had to pay a late fee. You had to have a membership card. And he chose one rule to break. You had to drive to a physical store. And he said, what if there was no physical store? Well, imagine a world where we might. Well, YouTube already exists. They stream amateur content. Oh, wait, you mean I just have to stream professional content? If I stream professional content uh, on an online service, nobody has to drive to a store. Nobody has to be kind of rewind. Nobody has to take it back. Everybody gets the one they want on opening day. And there's no late fees because I'll cut the rental off at 24 hours. I'll call it Netflix. I'll take my idea to Blockbuster five times. They'll turn me down five times. I'll take them out of business in five years. Um, I talked about product-centric versus consumer-centric cultures. In 2008, we could have started the question, how might we make more money? Had we have asked that question, we'd have probably put the prices up on the gate to get into the parks, and we'd have met our quarterly results. But we didn't. We said, how might we solve for the biggest consumer pain point? So we listed all the rules of going to a Disney park. It's hot, it's humid, I have to stand in line, I have to buy a ticket, meet Mickey Mouse, go on the rides, blah, 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 blah. We chose one, I have to stand in line. And I said, what if there were no lines? What if we had no entrance at the front of our park? What if you didn't have to stand in line to check in, to buy an item of merchandise or food? Fast forward, I, I thought people were going to come across the table and hit me when I suggested it. But come to 2016, Disney's Magic Band already exists. It arrives in the mail before, six weeks before you get to the park. It is your room key. I touch my room, I go in. It is my theme park ticket. I just swipe and I go. I have my reservations for my favorite attractions and my favorite character meet and greets. I just go. Merchandise, I touch it once, it goes to my hotel room. I touch it twice, it goes to my house. Think about the per caps on that. Fast food, I save my fast food on my phone. I know I want a hot dog with a pickle on the side. I'm going to Pinocchio's Village House for lunch. I walk in, the restaurant knows I'm here. It knows I want my pickles on the side and it brings the food fresh to me. Coming out of this project, two things happened. On average, the average guest now has two hours free time a day that they didn't have five years ago. What do you all do with your free time? Spend money. Saturday and Sunday are very expensive for you. So two hours free time a day. The single biggest revenue generating idea since Disneyland opened its gates on July 17, 1955. No significant capital investment required. No new rides, no new attractions, no new parades, no new fireworks. Yes, of course, there's some capital investment. Just by having the audacity to take the biggest rule and ask what if that rule no longer existed and then imagine a world where it might. A smaller example, just to give you a sense of how the tool works, was a very small company in Nottingham in England. They used to make glasses that we drink out of. And they found they had lots of breakages when it was being packaged. So they went down to the shop floor and watched their employees. And they listed all the rules. We pack in cardboard, six glasses to a box. The, boxes, the glasses are wrapped in newspaper. Employees are reading the newspaper. Could be why they have breakage and production issues. So they listed all the rules, one of which was employees reading the paper. And somebody had the audacity to ask the audacious what if question. If you don't ask an audacious what if question, you stay in your river of thinking. He said, what if we poke their eyes out? That's relatively audacious. It's also against the law and not very nice. But had he not raised the audacious question, the lady sitting next to him wouldn't have said, well, wait a minute, let's just hire blind people. And they did. Their production went up 48%, their breakage went down about 30%, and they got a 50% salary subsidy from the British government for hiring people with disabilities. Disney's Magic Band. Talk about real data and action. I know where you are every second of every day. I know what you like, I know what you don't like. Think about the products and services we'll create for the future. I know that 67% of the attendance now goes through my gate by 10.30 in the morning. I don't need Johnny on the front gate anymore. Johnny can have two or three other jobs during the day. Johnny's job is more fun 
I can layer, so I can reduce some of my labor costs. I know you're in line for Space Mountain right now, and I know there's a one hour wait. I know your daughter's favorite characters are Anna and Elsa, and I know exactly where they are, and I can text you right now and tell you. And you can go outside with your daughter and meet Anna and Elsa. I make you a hero. By giving the consumer something of real value, they, so you don't have to stand in line anymore. Here, let me have my, <laughs> here, have my firstborn, have my data. But if you're not offering something of significant value, then the consumer won't give you something of a significant value as well. But just by asking the question, what if, and challenging the rules of the Disney Park experience. How else? Words are remarkably powerful. Walt was the master of words and the master of this tool. On July 17, 1955, Walt, well, actually three weeks to go, the landscape artist came to Walt and said, hey, Walt, we've run out of money, time, and resources, and two thirds of the flower beds are full of weeds. What should we do? And Walt said, well, what's that weed called in Latin? I'm like, I don't know. He said, find out and put a little tag on it in Latin. And, and he said, that's how we'll open the park. Two thirds of the flower beds of Disneyland opened with exotic plants yet to be grown. Uh, but that, that's the fun example. The real example is on July 17th, 1955, Walt re-expressed the challenge. He said, we will not have customers visit our parks. We will only have guests. Think about how you treat a customer. Think about how you treat a guest. And with that, he created the single best level of guest service anywhere in the world, and I challenge anybody to tell me different. It's still the best level of guest service on the planet. Companies come from around the world to try to figure it out. Walt did it with one word. The other word he said was, we're not gonna have any employees. We'll only have cast members. Cast for a role in the show. They wore a costume, not a uniform. I have a friend, his name is Hector Rodriguez. He drives the boat backwards and forwards across the lake 57 times a day. He's done it for 32 years. But on the odd occasion where he comes to my house, he comes bursting through the door, big smile on his face. He said, you should see what I did for that guest today. Huge pride. All Walt did was re-express the challenge. I was in New York six months ago at a meeting. I was uh, waiting for my meeting. I was chatting to the young lady behind the front desk. And uh, when I went upstairs and I chatted to the boss, I said, hey, your receptionist is delightful. She's remarkable, she's empathetic, she's helpful. I'm gonna steal her and ask her to work for me. And he said, well, how long were you talking to her for? I said, I don't know, about 15 minutes. He said, well, that's really odd. And I said, well, why is that odd? And he said, well, we don't have a receptionist. He's like, who the hell was I talking to for the last 15 minutes? Um, and I said, well, I think her name was Sarah. She had a floral dress. He said, oh yeah, Sarah. He said, no, 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 no. She's our director of first impressions. I was like, Whoa with that one simple re-expression of somebody's form of employment. He didn't pay her any more money, didn't get any more bonus, any more shares. She has a business card, director of first impressions, and own the space she does. It's a remarkable tool to use. The other one I want to touch on is this. You know you have four billion neurons here? You have more down here. Think about the dress you bought last week, the place you decided to go this weekend, the meal you ate, the car you drive, that was a rational decision? <laughs> no, it was made here. Um, it's a remarkable tool. Hands up if you've ever stared at the head, at the back of the head of somebody, you think, oh wow, they're really good looking. And they turn around and stare at you immediately and you have to look away quickly. <laughs> How did they know? Intuition. It is a remarkably powerful tool that has been ignored, in my opinion, for too long. And again, big data will get bigger, faster, and more and that. But guess what? Our consumers are still human beings. I want to tell you a story about the power of intuition. We were tasked by Disneyland Paris of getting more people to come and spend more money. So our going in, a hypotheses, product-centric culture, we build it, they will come. We'll spend tens of millions of dollars on new product, they will come. And I said, well, before you do that, I want to get out of our big data, and I want to spend time with our consumers. So we went and lived with 26 families for a day. So hands up here, who has children? Okay, coming down again. Sir, close your eyes. You have a photograph of your children somewhere in your house or your office, yes? Where, whereabouts is it? 
Keep your eyes closed. No, no, it has to be a physical photograph. Okay. Okay. It's, on the shelf. it's on the shelf. In which room? Uh, the living room. The living room. And in, who's in the photograph? Uh, my son. My son. And where is he in that photograph? Where were you? Uh, at a bullfight. At a bullfight. And how old was he uh, in this photograph? How old is your son? Uh, ten. Ten. And how old is he today? Fifteen. Fifteen. Thank you. Twenty-six households later. When we asked how old the children were in reality, they were anywhere from 5 to 15 years older than that photo frame. So we thought, is it because we don't print pictures of our children anymore? Yes, we do. So I went back to my office, and there were my children, 7 and 9. No, no, no. My children are 20 and 22. <laughs> so I thought, what, what, what are we doing? So we dug a bit deeper. With, we went back and chatted to the mums. And here's what we found. Parents will tell you we want our children to grow up go to kindergarten, junior school, middle school, high school, university perhaps, get a job, be happy, healthy and successful, right? Is that what we want for our children? Yeah? No. <laughs> we want to keep them <laughs> in that tiny little photo frame. When we walk in the door at night, we are still Superman or Wonder Woman and they wrestle with us, right? That's why we love our grandchildren. Why? <clears throat> They're right back in the frame. So we dug a bit deeper, and we asked them more questions. And these women would tell me the stories. They're mums. Guess what? I'm a dad. I have intuition. And uh, they talked about three transitions between which a parent and a child must cross. Once you've crossed, you both want to step back desperately, but you can't. The first one for me, they're telling us the stories, but I resonated with all of them because I could use my intuition. I was in Monterrey, Mexico. It was Christmas Eve. Uh, he was 10. He came around the abuelita's bedroom door. He looked up at me. He was 10 years of age. You know when children have tears halfway up their eyes? They haven't started to cry yet, but they're just about to go. He said, are you Santa Claus? I was like, oh, man. Didn't see that coming. And I was just about to lie. I've been in public relations for years, so I could lie really quickly. I had lots of key messages. And... Uh, he said, Mummy said you are. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Batman, Spider-Man, Superman, creativity, clouds, imagination came crashing down. What he just said was, I'm not your little boy anymore. I'm growing up. The second one was, and dads will remember where they were. I remember where I was. I was outside Michael's department store in Kissimmee, Florida. I was, the curb was on this side. There was a black car coming this way. She was 13, and it was my left hand she dropped in public for the first time because she didn't want to hold daddy's hand in public anymore. And if you ask most of the dads in the room here, where were you when your daughter dropped your hand for the first time? They can answer you like that, and they remember if it was the right hand or the left hand. The last one was when she went off to college. We drove her up to uh, Auburn University. We hugged, we cheered, we laughed, said goodbye got in the car and cried her eyes out for four hours coming home. Don't forget, going in, we said if we spend tens of millions of dollars on new product, they will come. Coming out, what we realized was actually important just by spending a day with our consumer wasn't, she, mum does not wake up in the morning in Madrid going, ooh, ah, I wonder if Disneyland Paris is gonna have new product this year. Not even on the radar, but she does wake up every morning worried about how quickly her children are growing up and how she wants to make special memories for them while they still believe, while they still hold my hand, while they're still here. So instead of spending tens of millions of dollars on new product that people didn't want, we just created a communication campaign aimed at parent, parents of tiny children, dad of a tween daughter, because you can break his heart in a nanosecond, and parents of older children. We increased sales by 20%. Not intent to visit, sales. Intuition is a remarkably powerful tool. Creativity, imagination. You're born with all of them, by the way. You're also born curious. So question on curiosity. We talked about how children ask why, why and why again. That's how they learn, right? Um, let me ask you a question. Who goes to their favorite restaurant with a loved one two or three times a year. Oh, come on, people. <laughs> who, who reads all the appetizers, all the main courses, all the postres, listens to the specials, 
and then it orders the same thing they order every time. For the British people, it's chicken tikka masala, by the way. Um, <laughs> who sleeps on the same side of the bed every night? Come on, come on. Own it, own it. Okay, who sleeps on the same side of the bed every night, even when they're in a hotel room by themselves? <laughs> sad, sad. We are sad people. Um, have you ever driven home or taken a car, a bicycle, a bus, however you get home, a train, and you look at the door of your apartment, there's that split second where you think, whoa, whoa, how did I get here? I hope you weren't driving. Um, on the way home, your brain got bored, physically. It shut down, physically, because you were doing the same thing. It knows everything you're going to go past. Same thing at work. If, if you commute the same way every day, if you listen to the same radio station, if you have the weekly meeting, and the first 10 minutes of your weekly meeting is going to talk about safety, because that's the way we do it here. OK, great. But no new stimulus in, no fresh ideas out. Literally, your brain gets bored. And so you need to create new stimulus in your lives. Uh, we talked about the number one barrier to innovation being time. One of the most innovative companies in the world is Google. What does Google do that no other company in the world does? They give their in engineers in California 20% time, one day a week. Time to think. Came up with Gmail, Google, Google Maps, uh, Google Goggles, Google Glass. Not considered unsuccessful project. I'm not suggesting you can take a day a week, but give yourself half a day a month. Or how about one day a month? One day a quarter, you and all your employees. No meetings, no emails, no presentations, no phone calls. A day to think. Microsoft does that one week a year in Washington. Call it Think Week. You'd be amazed at the ideas they can tie back to Think Week. I'm going to finish on um, bravery, if I may. Um, not many companies encourage us to be brave. Who here is encouraged to be brave at work? Take risks. Good. Look at the entrepreneurs, look at the stuff. 30 years I worked inside a company. 12 months ago, I threw myself off a cliff and became an entrepreneur. I'm frightened every day. But I'm excited every day as well. And I think 50% excited, 50% frightened is a good place to be. I was going through the motions. I'd been there 30 years, that's the way we do it here. I needed to do something different. So to demonstrate bravery, what I thought I'd do is I'll ask, uh, I was gonna ask somebody to come up and sing with me to demonstrate bravery. Uh, I thought we'd do um, Don't Go Breaking My Heart, if you remember that one. Elton John and Kiki D, uh, 1973 mm -hmm. as I recall. Um, I've got the words on the screen up here. So uh, in just a moment, I thought I'll invite somebody to come and sing with me. But I wasn't sure if I'd get any volunteers. So um, during the lunch break, uh, I got to come in here when you were all out having lunch. And no, you may not look until the count of three. But underneath one of your lovely seats is a little sticker. And it just says, it's you. So on the count of three and not before, I'd like you to look under your chair. And if it's you, I'd like you to just come up with me. We're going to sing the chorus of Don't Go Breaking My Heart to demonstrate bravery. One, two, three. Okay, relax, people. I would not do that to you at the end of the first day. <laughs> I just wanted to see your faces. You all became very British very quickly. Oh, my God. Don't you? <laughs> Who is the bravest animal in the jungle? The lion. No. Uh, I think in Spanish, mariposa. Butterfly. The very large butterfly that just consumed your stomach, right? It was eating away. That's how nervous you were feeling just now when you thought you were gonna to have to get up here. When was the last time you felt that nervous at work? That scared. You don't have to feel like that every day. You don't have to feel like it every week or every month. But if you're not feeling like that two or three times a year, you are not innovating. Your job will go away. Artificial intelligence says so. Generation Z says so. You need to feel like that every now and then. But for all the downside, because I think there's enormous upside 
I think artificial intelligence is going to make our lives a lot better. I think Generation Z, thank God, will save us from ourselves because we've been so profit obsessed for years. Now we'll actually have to focus on something that counts. Um, but the good news is this. While artificial intelligence may be 5,000 times more intelligent than us f 10 years from now, they will not have human imagination. It will not have creativity. It will not have intuition, human emotional intelligence, perhaps curiosity. The good news is you're born with all of them. It's just a question of reminding yourselves to be playful, reminding yourself to ask how might we rather than how can we, and by being brave. And I'll finish on my favorite quote, which is the opposite of bravery is not cowardice, it's conformity. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, we've got one more panel before probably the most important part of the day, which is our startup competition. The 10 finalists are going to present right after this panel, and we'll be able to announce the winners. But before that, our next panel is about education disrupted. We've got five startups, Bernard Meissner, CEO of Buzu, Freddy Vega, CEO of Platzi, and Daniel Suarez Sanchez, CEO of Zapiens. And we've got three investors. Avi Warsawski, managing partner of High Grade, Marie-Christine Levet, founder of EduCapital, and Sonia Fernandez from Kibo, managing partner. Now, a good friend of mine who's also a professor at IE and a mentor and a serial entrepreneur, now CEO of Open Innovation at Telefonica, Miguel Arias, is going to moderate. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Maria Christine, Miguel Arias, Avi, Freddy, Bernard, Daniel, and Sonia. Thank you. If I. Awesome. 
Hello, everybody. It's great, great to be here. I think you enjoyed a lot the last, the last uh, speaker, so I hope we can also keep up with that high level of engagement in this lively discussion with these amazing investors and, and entrepreneurs, right? I think it's, it's great to be able to talk about the two visions, right? From the entrepreneurial perspective and from the investment perspective at, at once. So I, I would like to find out with the first question for, for Marie-Christine. I mean, you are an, an early pioneer in the internet and, and also you are a, an ed tech investor. So you have this privileged vision on where technology in EdTech is going. So we'd like to hear from you and see how many passwords you can use in the same sentence. So what do you think is the key trends in technology in EdTech? Is it blockchain? Is it AI? Can you give us some light around that? So hello, everybody. So I will definitely say uh, AI and uh, adaptive learning. I think that uh, if you look at the EdTech, you know, like the first wave of EdTech was like, you know, access to platforms that democratize the access to education. It was platforms like Coursera or in France Open Classroom that give access to you know, class uh, courses from all over the world. Coursera now attracts you know, 34 million users yeah. and at, in six years has been able to catch up with Oxford. And now I think the, um, the biggest trend is personalization of education. So everything related to how you use you know, progress of uh, neuroscience, and how you understand better how the brain works, and because everybody learns and memorizes in a different way. And this is what AI will be able to do, you know, on a large scale, give to everybody a personalized path of learning. So I think this is the biggest trend. But then, you know, AI in EdTech becomes a buzzword. Like every <laughs> startup now uses AI in its speech. And I think exactly. that not everybody is doing real, real AI, because you need to really be able to you know, manage a lot of data to do real AI. So you have to be uh, clever and understand the real AI and the not so real uh, adaptive learning. But I think personalization, and the good thing of personalization in education is that it really reduced drop rate. You know, all the studies show that, for example, Arizona State of the uh, Arizona University has done a lot of studies in AI and in math learnings. And they have been uh, able to prove that it has reduced drop rate by 50%. So I think that's really, and what, that's one of the biggest impact you know EdTech could have in uh, you know in the in the in the society is reducing really the people that really go out of school and drop out of school. Very nice. Well, and you mentioned you do manage lots of data. You actually need to get access to this data, which is not easy either, right? I mean, that data becomes a very wealthy thing, and not every startup has access to all this information. I would like to see if there is any controversy here and ask for all, each of you of, in one single sentence, if possible, if you agree this AI uh, the key trend, or is there anything else? So maybe starting from Avi and moving to the rest. Well, in general, uh, um, I believe that in the end of the day, it's not technology that makes the difference, but rather a human behavior that based on technology, like if we look on, and let's say, Uber or Airbnb, they changed the world in, in their domain. It wasn't with the technology, although technology was involved An there. An enabler, right? Yeah. 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 But uh, echoing what, what Marie-Christine was saying, I think AI is a really game changer uh, because it changes our behavior, and especially around the uh, dialogue and conversation, like all the chatbots and uh, uh, voice uh, uh, um, assistants can really change the world in these senses. Awesome. So great. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Sonia, please. <laughs> I think also as a, as a trend, um, parents um, and really the consumer is really investing a lot in non-curricular uh, expense for the household. So I think we're seeing a lot of um, big trends in, in tools that parents can really access in terms of you know, additional math courses or language for children. So it's really startups that target the consumer in a more non-curricular, so outside of the school. Uh, and that's something that there, there's a lot of uh, consumer uh, money that is, um, you know, each household is devoting to that. So I think that's a very interesting trend as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Freddie, one sentence. What do you think is the key technology that's going to change ed tech? I don't think that it's going to be artificial intelligence. There is uh, not. <laughs> I think that artificial intelligence <laughs> oh, yes. okay. will be present everywhere. But I think of, I, well, first of all, I think that people overestimate what artificial intelligence actually is. 
it's fancy parent recognition. It's <laughs> not yet conversational AIs or stuff like that. It is extremely useful, and it opened the path for things like adaptive learning, which I think are going to be game changers at a certain level. But we still have bigger problems in terms of education. Um, I, I don't want to be negative. I, I think that ed tech is going to be something, it's already something that is affecting a lot of people's lives. And that for the first time, people that live in a country without infrastructure, as long as they have internet and a computer, will be able to compete in the tech industry. But that's not true for other kinds of jobs that require infrastructure. So that's an unsolved issue right now. And the other issue that we have is what we see in OCDE countries, which is that in many of the developing world, the biggest issues are still kind of beyond the reach of ed tech, which is uh, reading comprehension and mathematical analysis. Having people that actually can read and comprehend a complex text, and people that can think of a problem in a mathematical way, instead of just trying to see proof and error to see if they can fix something. Uh, that's a real game changer. And so far, the only way that we have found is scalable to have that is to have the parents involved, which is not very techy and really hard to replicate. Good point. Very good point. So Bernard, maybe you want to add that? Um, I would still say I do agree with Marie-Christine that I believe there's a lot of application of AI in education. And maybe also to give a practical example of we are, what we are doing at Buzo, because sometimes this AI is this magical uh, stuff that people don't really understand of what it actually could mean. And in our case, for example, we can now predict forgetting curves of our users. We know exactly when they have seen which vocabulary, at which time they learn, so we can then surface the right vocab at the right time. And it simply then drives better learning outcomes. It's maybe not this super sophisticated AI and the robot and uh, I don't know what, but still we can see in our models that it just helps people to learn a language much faster. But I also do agree with you. There's still a lot of basic issues with ad tech in general. And we have been in the industry now for 10 years. In the very early days, it was very hard uh, to reach users in emerging markets, whereas now they all are on a mobile phone. They have a credit card. The platforms have done a lot of progress to actually be able to charge those users and keep them in the monetization cycle. And that helps us as an ad tech startup also to scale. Yeah, some basic stuff needs to be in place just to even be thinking about something more fancy and sophisticated. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And Danny? Yeah, from my side, is, uh, it's not about technology. Uh, inside of AI, there is a discipline that it's called uh, natural language processing. In my company, we are completely crazy about this. So we love to understand the words. Technology is knowledge of techniques. So basically, humans, all the companies all over the world are technology. For me, the chance is not in technology, it's in philosophy. Uh, technically, philosophy is friends of the knowledge. So I think that definitely we have to change the paradigm in order that we are working as humans, in order that in the future are going to be humans, humans, and robots, robots. Uh, my point is that many times are humans working as robots, and sometimes robots working as humans. So there is a <laughs> phrase that explains everything. When you think that a human is great, you say it's like a machine. And when you think that the machine is great, you say, wow, it looks human. So I'm <laughs> saying, sorry, I'm we crazy? Uh, humans to do the job of humans with creativity, and machines to do the job of machines. That's the chance that I want to watch outside. Very nice. I like this human robot or robot human. Yeah. Very nice. So what I like about this panel is we have different kind of entrepreneurs from early stage to much more advanced and much more experienced. We raise over the tens of millions of dollars. Same thing with investors, with early stage investors and more later stage investors. So I would like to follow this uh, this path, with this roller coaster with you and ask you a few questions. I would like to start with Avi. You invest mostly in early stage startups in the UK and Israel. What is it, it's maybe good for the audience, which kind of things are you looking for when you are trying to find disruptive teams without very much market validation yet? Well, I, I think we're looking at mainly two things. Like, first of all, the team. It should be a team that, uh, and it's always almost a cliche, but it's a, it's a correct cliche. <laughs> teams that can really deliver, teams that uh, have a very good bonding among themselves and, and a good relationship, and a team that is flexible enough uh, to change and pivot down the road. And uh, as to the product, we're looking for products that are not amplifiers of the existing system. Like, we don't look for another uh, LMS system or another ebook system uh, that really take or try to 
look at the uh, present and try to reflect it in, in, uh, in a stronger way. We don't look for those kind of startups. We look for startups that really uses this uh, culture of, of, uh, of uh, the digital age to really uh, suggest an alternative to the educational world, like really change this, this uh, atmosphere. Very nice. And moving then to the entrepreneurial perspective, Dani, you are a young startup, so you, you started recently. What are the things are the biggest challenges you're facing in this early stage in Spain, particularly? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, in Spain, and giving context, we are from Asturias. So, I'm uh, from Asturias too, so <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> in my village, there are four people, today three. Yeah. So, <laughs> basically, it's um, and the first year we are three years old. The first year in the beginning, like in, in every place, is about to have the team uh, build something great and, and passionate in order to share with others. The biggest challenge in the beginning was to have the trust of big corporates. For us, it was completely changeable. Uh, I remember the, the first year to have the trust of Nespresso or Unilever changed everything. Because when you knock on the door of big corporates and they watch you and say who you are. <laughs> Uh, now it's a completely different stage. Now we are working with more than 30 great corporates. So now the challenge is how to scale. Uh, I just came from US uh, this year. And they have a great um, massive uh, market. And so all the VCs say, why you don't move there? And I always say, I'm from the United States of Europe. So uh, I prefer growing organically in Europe and discovering, for example, yesterday I was in France, my CEO is today in Austria. I think that we have a great biodiversity. Uh, it's difficult, it's completely different, it's not the easy way, but I think that if we believe more and the, they have Hollywood, they, are, they have Hollywood, so they have all the trust, but we know we have the complexity in biodiversity. So if we use in the right way, I think that we could change the, the game completely. Nice. If we move forward then in company evolution, Ferry uh, Plants is now having enormous traction, already very significant rounds of, of funding. And you, as you were telling me, you are based in many different cities yourself, right? I mean, you, you're moving between Bogota, Mexico, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, there is this trend of Latin American companies who are able to become pan-regional and sell from Bogota into uh, maybe Santiago de Chile or Argentina. Uh, do you think there is potential for these pan-regional companies in LATAM, or should you be looking more into the U.S. as a bigger market? That's interesting. Um, we, no, we focus mostly on the Latin American market. Most of our students come from there. We have 700,000 students right now. Um, I think that Latin America is special for a very specific reason. If you compare the amount of money that they invest in Latin America versus the amount of money that VCs invest in India, India wins by far. Yeah. But the GDP per capita and the, and the buying power of an average Latin American is way higher than that of the average Indian. The market is bigger. The issue is that India is a single market, while Latin America is 12 different markets. Platzi, for example, charges in 12 different currencies. And because we have our accounting in US dollars, every time that something <laughs> weird happens in Argentina or Mexico, etc., I have to add a slide to the board meeting. So in Argentina, <laughs> this happened. It's not my fault. In subscribers, I'm still growing. They just lost 72% of their value. So that's an issue when you do things in Latin America. But on the other hand, the beauty about doing education in developing markets is that they appreciate it more and work harder. The biggest issue with alternative education in developed markets is that the mainstream, they don't go for it. Normally, when you see a developed market, there are normally two types of customers for non-traditional education. One is the very poor, and the other is the very rich. The very rich because they are witnesses to what happens when you invest in your own education, and most of their people around them, hopefully, are lifelong learners. And the very poor, the very poor because they're screwed by default. They don't have a choice they will invest more of their own income to try to advance in life and to try to get their kids to advance in life. In developing markets, in places like Latin America, you obviously see that, but you see it in the middle class as well. Everybody's trying to advance. And the other issue with Latin America is that of all the people that we have that are at an age bracket or a situation where they can get higher education, only 14% of them get it. Not because they can't, sometimes they can't, but mostly because that's the amount of chairs that you have at universities in Latin America. Only as many as 14%. 
which effectively means that going to college is a privilege. Going to college is something that you can only do if you were born in the right family, if you were born in the right city. That's why I think that we are going to still focus on Latin America, and we're going to still focus in developing markets, because the opportunity is huge. And we have only scratched the surface. We have 700,000 students, but last year, 1.5 million jobs in the tech industry remain vacant. Not that there are 1.5 million jobs, but that 1.5 million opportunities didn't have a candidate. So the hunger for talent is big, and because of the automation of everything, the hunger for technical talent will remain big for a long time. So I'm basically very hopeful. And then one question to you. Why then open an office in Silicon Valley at all? Is it for funding? We have the official answer and the real answer. <laughs> we are here alone with just some friends. So, so as long as this yeah. stays here. Yeah. So the real answer is mostly, yeah, funding, of course. Yeah, yeah. When, when you try to raise money in Silicon Valley and you don't have an office in San Francisco, it's weird. So, and everybody does it. It's not only Latin America. I see people in Canada that say, oh, yeah, we have an office in San Francisco. What they have is a subscription to WeWork. So sometimes they can rent a room, but that's it. Uh, we, have an actual, we have an actual office. If I have investors <laughs> here, we have an actual office yeah. in Silicon Valley. My co founder bigger, lives there. It's a bigger WeWork, right? But, but there's another, yeah, bigger WeWork. <laughs> there's another reason. Um, we at Platzi, what we want to achieve is that we want to pivot the economies of Latin America. We want to make uh, the economies of our countries economies that are no longer based on natural resources and manufacturing. We want them to actually leverage the human talent that we have in our nations. To do that, we get teachers from Silicon Valley, people that are doing the best in each one of these topics that we teach, and we train them to be better teachers, and we get them to do courses for Latin America. So we produce content over there, and we get money from over there, and we bring it to Latin America. And now you're a Delaware company, or...? No, I'm a Delaware C-Corp, yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Delaware C-Corp, yeah. That opens a complete new panel if we talk about <laughs> Delaware, <laughs> yeah. So uh, moving then back to the investor side and a bit more later stage, I mean, Sonia, you in Kivo, you have invested in many of the most successful stories from Spanish entrepreneurs moving internationally, and many moved to Latin America too, right? So and there is these two kind of markets that Fred explained here, and a friend of mine explained it was like hard butter, markets where the knife is hard to, to cut into the butter, right? Or the soft butter, where the knife actually gets a bit easier, but there's much more competition. So what do you see? We, we saw Freddie's opinion, which he clearly understood. But what do you think would you encourage entrepreneurs to do from Spain and other countries? Should they try to expand in LATAM or in Southeast Asia? Or should they try to go to the US as the biggest markets for the beginning? I think it depends. I mean, we don't see Latin America being the natural expansion area for a Spanish company, per se. No. no. And to be honest, you know, some companies in our portfolio, education and non-education, have gone Latin America, but most have really expanded into Europe and into the US. And we have a lot of companies that have opened up offices in, in the US, and they're attacking both markets. It really depends on the product. Uh, we have companies like Odilo, for instance, and they're, they're very big in Latin America. They have a product that, because they have access to content in Spanish, that's really differenti that's a differentiating factor for them. So it's made a lot of sense for them to, to go to countries like Uruguay. They're working on really interesting projects in Peru and Chile. And you know, they're talking to the governments to really see how they can improve reading uh, skills for, for uh, for kids in school using their platform and access to the content. But equally, they're competing in the US uh, and getting projects to, uh, to win um, and have their content being in, in public libraries in New York and in other states. So it really depends. We have another uh, company in our portfolio called GameLearn, which is in a similar space as uh, our friend uh, here. And they sell to, uh, to corporates. And um, you know, they're in Spain, they're in Latin America, and they're expanding into Europe simultaneously. So I think as long as you have a product that can scale, um, you know, our, the reason why we fund companies is because they have the, the team that is able to scale the company, and it doesn't need to be. Sometimes you know, it could be even easier to, to go to Europe than Latin America, just because maybe the maturity of the market is different, and they're more you know, uh, their willingness to adopt new technology is there quicker, so it depends. So there is no recipe, yeah. unfortunately. No. So <laughs> then let me go back to the entrepreneur. We have here Bernard, the, the veteran in the room, I would say, right, after 10 years 
run in Visu very successfully. I think you are now reach 80 million users, right? which is completely mind blowing. So you were mostly doing a lot of B2C, but but you are after recently started to do more B2B and working with corporates. Yeah. And since you have also some corporates in the room, some of them from Telefonica, <coughs> so <laughs> maybe you can you can explain how do you think startups can work with a corporate in the ad tech environment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we started as a, a consumer business, and we're focused on that for quite some time. And then actually we did the mistake of going into corporate far too early. Mm -hmm. So we might have had a few million users at that time, and we thought this actually makes so much sense to offer a product also to corporates. And we put a bit of more effort on that, and I went to you know, fancy corporate fairs and you know, trying to sell to corporates. But at the same time, actually, our core product was not yet right. <laughs> and therefore, I think it's so important when you start working with corporates that you just have an absolutely awesome product. Because if you try to do two things at the same time, it will just break. Because also, at the end of the day, I think corporates have now changed in the sense what they want for their employees is actually, ideally, what their employees want for themselves. It's not anymore the sales dude with his luggage that goes with some B2B platform that's just terrible, has a terrible user interface, no usage and whatsoever. I think those days have gone. We really, I think, accelerate by having an amazing user experience. And we now are the global provider, for example, for Inditex, who use our platform for 150,000 employees worldwide. So I think you know, we really needed to find the right timing. And also, as a startup, you know, B2B takes much longer than B2C. So the sales cycles can really also kill you if you don't have the right interface. But I think it's so important to just have a great product. Then it will also work. I love this. I think it's called like this consumerization of the applications, right? That you as a user want to have the same experience in your daily life, that exactly. at work, and learn the same way, and play the same way. So there's going to be a blurry of lines around B2C and B2B over time. Uh, absolutely, because at the end of the day, employee also uses Facebook and Twitter and plays and these it. games, so they want to have cool experiences as a learning experience as well. Awesome. I would like to finish the questions for the, for the entrepreneurs here. And maybe since you are, uh, or if you can remember your early days, what do you think, Danny and Freddie, was the key factor that uh, helped you be successful at the beginning? So maybe Danny first and then Freddie, yeah. if you uh, know it. Yeah, <laughs> in, in our case, I think that again, philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah, uh, I always say that we are not a technology company. <laughs> Everyone is a technology. We think that we, the key point is to be honest with our <coughs> philosophy and that we want to change. Let me show you a really simple example. When we have a meeting with some corporate, uh, we only define two different kind of human resources managers. All is cool. It means I have to manage real and material things. Uh, so if I buy a machine, it goes to the balance like an investment. If I invest in a learning, for example, in a human, that is an expense. So these kind of people say to me, can you prove that if I invest in people, because investing in people is, is really risk. And on that time, I say, no, sorry, I don't have time to, uh, to explain you this. This is lesson one. If you don't think about this, OK, it's your way. And so our point is focus the energy on the virus, on people that understand that the future is about uh, uh, manage intangible things, emotions, learnings, behaviors, and knowledge. Um, so focus on that, and don't waste our energy on try to convince people that need uh, proofs. It's about time it's, it's there. Focus is critical. And so, yeah. Freddy, what's your key piece? Sure. I think it was two things. First, that we charge money. In the, when we started, it was very common to see online educational platforms that were free. And they had really low completion rates. And because they raise a lot of money from Silicon Valley, which is something that it's absolutely impossible for Latin American companies that are just starting, they were able to just be free for a while. We self-funded our operation. And to this day, we've been profitable every day of every month. At first, we charged a lot, $95 per course. And now we charge $1 per day to have access to all the 220 wow. courses that we have. We try to keep it under a dollar a day so that we can reach as, much, uh, as many people as we can. And the second thing is that we focus on outcomes. We don't focus on anything else. We want to see if what we do actually change people's lives. So we do an impact report every year. And we know, we know now that, on average, a year after a student finishes one of the uh, careers at Platzi, which takes more or less a year, they will increase their income between 54% to 260%. 
I think that a lot of online education offerings focus on a lot of things. And the most important things are, are people learning? And what they're learning, is it actually changing their lives? There are many types of education. And entertainment education, it's totally fine. But we decided to focus on outcomes, on getting people better lives through education. <coughs> Well, what, a, what a slogan, right? Better lives for education. <laughs> Love it. So let me move then the question back to the investors in the room. And this is for, for you, my Christine. I mean, the, there are all these hubs around the world of, of startups like FinTech in London or like Biotech in Boston. And do you feel there are some hubs appearing in the world around EdTech? And I, I'm sure you're going to say Paris, but that's perfectly fine. You can say that too. <laughs> Basically, I think the uh, ad tech scene is uh, quite bo booming in, uh, in Europe, and it's quite new. I think that the fact that we have a big conference in here in Spain about ad tech is uh, you know, a proof. I think in, in Europe, if, you, if we see, you know, they're like the Stan Scandinavian countries are quite advanced, uh, because there's a big autonomy in terms of uh, what the teachers can do in schools. And you know, so a lot of uh, schools and teachers test a lot of new products, so I think this is, and Finland has made, you know, it's uh, the school, the teaching the way Finland teach has made, uh, export that elsewhere. Then I think Israel is quite good in terms of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see, you know, Spain, France, you know, a lot of uh, booming startups. There's like 3,000 uh, European startups in EdTech. Oh, wow. So I think it's quite a huge uh, number. What we have now is that for the moment, a lot of startups are still small, you know, because it's a new area, mm -hmm. I think. EdTech is a bit like the web was, uh, you know, like 20 years ago. But you know, we begin to have examples of companies that have been able to scale, like you yourself in you know, Buzu. In France, we have Open Classroom that really did a big fundraise. You know, they yeah. attract General Atlantic for 60 million euro. That was really you know, one of the biggest uh, fundraise in uh, EdTech in Europe. So I think you know, really, it's uh, it's booming. What we have, which is quite, I think, we are lagging a bit behind. China and uh, US, mainly due to the length of converting our educational systems to uh, ed tech. <laughs> Very good point. And what do you think is then the ingredient, the key ingredient that will be missing? Is it more funding? Is it more talent for the companies? Is it more market? Is it a better system to go into the education system? It's a sort of vicious circle because <laughs> in, order, in order to have funding, you need to have market. You know, what, you know, often, you know, Startups fail because they, uh, they are in a too, the, the market size, the potential of their market is too small. So, you know, it's a, so in, you need to have a market. So the way I see, you know, the different market evolving, I think, you know, they have different maturity. You know, corporate uh, training begins to be a mature market. Uh, companies, you know, want to have ROI on their, you know, investment in education. So I think they're moving forwards, you know, digital with a lot of new things like virtual reality, uh, mobile uh, learning. Then the lifelong learning, it's also, I think, a booming market. I think there's not perhaps enough startups in this area. And uh, you know, people, because there's a lot of things about are people paying for you know, educational content. And I think in lifelong learning, when really it helps you raise your employability and find a job, people are paying for that. In France, you know, the government will invest five billion you know, really to retrain unemployed workers and then to retrain people, you know, really in lifelong learning. So that's a huge potential. Yeah. Then higher head is also <coughs> moving fast, and we see IE here in Spain really uh, very, very innovative because I think you know competition now in higher head is really international. And if you want to attract the best students, you need to be very innovative. Then K-12, this is the market where it's the most difficult, and mainly because the road to market is quite long, because you have often to convince you know, schools after schools. But you know, I think things are changing, and it, that depends a lot to uh, political uh, decisions. You know. Nice. So let me then move the question to Sonia for a second. I mean, you mentioned quite a few trends right now, uh, Mary Christine, about things that might be interesting. Do you concur with what just I said? I mean, what do you see are the key trends from a business perspective? Is it going to be more B2C, more B2B, more mature, more later stage? What, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I was reading about data from 2017. There was like 9.5 billion um, investment in, in ed tech around the world. And only 13% of that was K-12, and 8% of that was what is called K-20. So essentially, you know, K-12 
kids, K to 12 and, and, and high school and beyond. So I think that is really fundamentally, there's like a missing link because there's a lot of money invested in, in edtech, but not enough it is really going to the classroom. And we need to understand why. And it's probably because you know, investors, we need a return. And, and it's very difficult to change the, the go to market for some of the you know, we, we were studying some startups that wanted to go into the K-12 market in the US. And I was in the US talking to friends that I have in that space. And, and they were like, don't go there. <laughs> it's just very, very, very tough. Even if they have great content, science, it's just very difficult. So I think the trend is moving more towards consumer related. I think there's a lot of money, what I was saying before, in terms of, you know, um, outside of the curriculum investment. Uh, and then corporate uh, learning and, and, and really, um, you know, more advanced learning. So, so that is really being where investors would see more of the ROI and immediate ROI. But I think it's a shame. I think hopefully we can see more of that budget or investment being deployed into going to the classroom because I think that's what's going to change fundamentally, you know, the, the educational system in, in many areas that are currently lacking, as you were saying before, math skills and reading skills that are really game changers for developing countries. So. Nice, good. So let's talk valuations between you and me, Abby. Nobody is, nobody is listening. So, I mean, we see valuations skyrocketing almost everywhere in the startup land. So what do you think about ad tech? Are valuations very high? Are they still going to be growing massively? What, has, what is your take on this? Well, it depends, I think, in uh, which geography we're speaking about and which <laughs> stage. Like, uh, if okay. you're looking on the West Coast in the US, the evaluation is very high and uh, sometimes really not realistic in the sense of uh, having in any point in the future uh, ROI for this kind of, uh, of investment. Uh, if you look in the East Coast, uh, if you look at Europe, Israel, you see more companies that are uh, really working with a very tight uh, spreadsheet and, and uh, having a very uh, bootstrap uh, process. Uh, and of course, uh, um, you also we, there is differences in, in the stages. Like I think uh, we have a really lack of investments uh, <coughs> in the stage of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, late seed stage and, and uh, early A stage, and, uh, and then we see lower valuations. I must say that uh, although uh, we, we used to look at bubbles in, in a wrong way or in a negative way, okay. I think they have a very positive effect. Like in the end of the day, uh, those companies who are growing, like most of the Israeli companies, bootstrapping, sometimes cannot really scale in the way they could because all the investments are really, really realistic. And uh, the idea about startup is, is bringing a dream, bringing something which is not really existing yet <laughs> in reality. And then one of those bubbles might turn on to be, to be real. But uh, in order to do it, you have to do a lot of them. And so I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to have both. So we have Freddy and Marie well, yeah, Marie Christian and Freddy, yeah? If no, I can add something, I think uh, what's quite interesting in EdTech is that we are sitting on a very huge market. You know, education market is like 6.3 trillion. In each country, it's 6% <coughs> of GDP. And it has only been digitalized at 3%. 3% of the EdTech market is digitalized versus, you know, like 40% media, 15 to 20% in retail. So, you know, it's a huge market. Where, like, in some other areas, yeah. They don't have this uh, huge opportunity. Huge and untapped. That is the two yeah, things, right? Huge, huge and untapped. untapped. Yes. Nice. Freddy, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I wanted to add that I feel like there is an incredible storm coming in EdTech, <laughs> which is highly correlated with the valuations. Some things <laughs> that have never happened are happening now. Many IPOs, plural site, Udacity, Udemy. Uh, we already had the 2U IPO. Uh, the huge companies in China, like Liu Li Shuo. And also, for the first time, MBAs are going down. Universities are having a hard time filling MBA seats. And at the same time, a student debt for formal education has never been higher. It's crazy high, and it's not correlated to um, increasing wages, especially in the developed world. So a lot of things are happening at the same time regarding education that will create a lot of money in M&A, in IPOs, and a huge change in terms of how people think of education beyond just a degree and into lifelong learning. And obviously, you have automation, which is like this dark force behind. So this 
convergence of factors are the ones that are creating the abnormal valuation ecosystem right now. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me share you a, a story about my grandpa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's about a cow and a market. So, and, and it's something like, now I understand because I'm a cow and a market. So the same cow in Asturias valuation is one million. The same cow in Madrid maybe it's 5 million. The same cow in London, maybe it's 10 million. And the same cow in Silicon Valley is 40 million. So uh, I spent this last year as a cow visiting the different markets. And I feel on my mirror and I, I look at myself and I'm be the same. But no, you are not the same. <laughs> it's everything about the market. So actually, Bernard, you mentioned that moving Madrid to London also had an impact at the time, right, in valuation and? Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, when we started, I think the term Ad tech was not yet defined. When I was said I work in an ad tech company, investors were like, ad tech, like advertising <laughs> uh, technology? Like, no ad tech. I mean, it's my Austrian accent. So <laughs> it was still very early days. And there was absolutely no financing in this industry because it was also 2008, financial crisis, all the VCs were kind of closed. And ad tech is just a long term game because simply it takes so long to create user success. It's so much easier to buy shoes on an e commerce website and be happy about the shoe next day, but to learn something on a platform just takes a a lot of user interactions. And therefore, the question is whether the traditional VC model with the five-year funds, lengths, and so on, are actually made for, for ad tech, because you need to have a very long-term view on this industry. So I always say, you know, if you're in ad tech, if running a normal startup is, a, uh, is run a, like a marathon and not a sprint, running an ad tech is an Ironman. So I think it just <laughs> takes so longer. And uh, to a certain extent, those uh, IPOs and liquidity events are very good for the industry because it confirms uh, the ability for yeah. people to make money. But still, we're just at the very early beginning of this industry. Awesome. I know we have a few minutes left. I would like to check if there's any questions for the audience. I can go on and on and on for hours, but maybe there's somebody else who wants to ask something. Any, anyone from the audience? Oh, we were so crystal clear. Nobody has any question? No, I don't see that. Okay. We're not going to do it. Well. Yeah. Okay. So do we have any make? Is this even possible? If you say it to me, I will say it loudly if not. Nobody did this before in the whole day. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, w I was gonna do it for you, but then you can do it yourself. Okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> but yeah, do you guys hear the question? No, but you didn't. No. But no, the audience didn't. The okay. audience didn't. So please go go ahead. So I'll just say my name is Taylor. Um, I have spent the last five years in Vietnam working in educational startup, and the kind of like core thing that we always worry about is our philosophy that is facing the students. Like, what experience are the students having in the classroom every day? They go home, they tell their parents, they tell their friends what's going on in the classroom. And now we're kind of moving to the hybrid model, the educational model that's online and beyond. And I'm thinking from each of these panelists, what kind of philosophy do you feel is most important to bring into the classroom day to day? So keep it very, very short, please. One sentence each, or the ones who want to answer, yeah? I'm not sure I get it. What yeah. kind of velocity? I, I philosophy, philosophy, philosophy. You are yeah, yeah. teaching right. the students. Um, yeah. oh, okay. Do you okay. speak about philosophy? Let me. <laughs> uh, in, from my point of view, there is only simplifying too much. Three philosophies. Um, first one is, um, you know, the film 300, right? Okay, so that's Is this going to be a short answer? Or a no, no, yes, short answer. answer. Okay. So, expertise, Sparta, uh, Socrates, dialogue, and Aristoteles, speech. I think that the problem is that everything is about speech and not people speaking. From my side, is Socrates, dialogue, as simple as that. Oh, anyone wants to answer? Yeah? I think it's, it's all about learning outcomes. I mean, if the users have a great experience online and learn something, they will come back. That's what is all that matters. In our, in our case, yeah, yeah. In our case, our core value, which is also our tagline at Platzi, is never stop learning. Abandon the idea that you will study one career for the rest of your life and embrace the idea that every five to 10 years, you will learn to be something completely new. And to be able to do that, you should never stop learning. We encourage that in our students a lot. I think for me, it's getting students engaged. So I think probably the traditional method 
of the teacher standing up and the student receiving the information is, is not the way that kids interact with anything nowadays. So it's really getting them engaged and whether it's flipping the classroom, making it more um, you know, focused on them or doing them, uh, asking them to do assignments where they're getting engaged. It's really for, for the teacher to, to, to find a way that children can be, you know, like to learn, which is really the challenge. But uh, anything, any platform that allows for that and allows, gives teachers those tools, uh, I think that, you know, there's real potential there. I think it's like for children more motivation, more engagement. And you know, as like 65% of the children in primary school will do a job that we don't know what this job will be. I think it's really teaching them how to be flexible, creative, how, how to learn, uh, how to learn all, all their life long, how to develop their critical thinking more than really uh, the traditional uh, methods. I think from a startup perspective, I think the best attitude should be to have no philosophy, to come really uh, very open to this audience, like uh, you are an anthropologist or research uh, an entity that you never saw before, because these kids are so different from kids five years or ten years before, so you really have to understand the place they are in now and then structure your philosophy, and uh, we try to encourage our startups to work in this, in this methodology. Wonderful. I think, unfortunately, time's, time's up. So I would love to thank all the, all the panelists. As we said, this is an Iron Man, yeah, the VNA tech entrepreneur, but we have the support of great investors here. So we are now willing to hit the pitches of the, of the finalists. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin the startup competition and light it 
first edition of the startup competition. Let me give you a little bit of context before we get going. Since the month of June, Enlighted has put together a competition all over the world. They received over 600 applications, of which they got a list of about 200 that had to do with education technology. That resulted in a short list of 18 that competed today. And now we have the 10 finalists. We have a jury of over 25 of the most reputable education experts in the country, including VCs, investors, serial entrepreneurs, and even the odd entrepreneurship chairman of a big business school. We're, at the end of this process, we're going to have four prizes. We're going to have the IE Education Prize given by IE University. We're going to have the Fundación Telefónica Social Content Prize given by Fundación Telefónica. And we're also going to have the Waida Educación Telefónica Digital Prize. And then we're going to have the first enlightened grand prize that will be chosen by this reputable jury. So let the show begin. Each team will have three minutes, and then we'll have time for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming this team from Brazil. They are going to revolutionize learning a language. How are they going to do it? They're going to apply AI and virtual reality gamification. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming B-Tools. Hello, everybody. Okay. Sorry, no, it wasn't me. So, uh, wait, stop it. Okay, let's see here. So, hello, everybody. My name is Fabio, and I am the CEO of B Tools. We created a brand new environment for learning, and I'm bold enough to say that we are reinventing education in a digital world. Families have changed a lot in the past 100 years. So my question is, why haven't schools? Believe me, this is an advertisement for an English school. Look how motivated students are. Right. So what we do is, we change the environment. We change the way students learn. And we change the business model for language schools. If you want to learn a new language, you have basically two options today. First, regular traditional schools with good learning results, but it takes a long time period and offers very poor motivation for students. Second option, these very cool apps with great motivation for students, but insufficient learning results. And then you have B2s which combines the best of the two models with regular classes that uses technology in order to offer results and brings motivation for students. How do we do it? First, VR platform. We produce 25 hours of content for, uh, for virtual reality. Actually, we created a complete uh, virtual reality series where the student is a character in first person talking to the actors. Second, an app. We're launching an app using gamification, neuroscience, and meaningful content to engage students. And third, data processing system. We use artificial intelligence and big data in order to make a profile of every student, check their performance, and improve the classes according to their results. Again, VR platform, an app, data processing system all combined with the flipped classroom methodology. That's what makes B-Tools unique. We are currently operating in Brazil, an over billion euro market, and we have plans to expand it to every possible country around the world. We've been operating for only three months, and we have uh, some great achievements already, such as 1,700 app users, 24 schools licensed, and a retention of students 80% higher than traditional schools. Our team was created by, first, me, an entrepreneur, 
uh, with over 10 years' experience in language teaching fields, and Binoculus, a startup leader in extended reality in Latin America. Today, we have a group of 35 outstanding people focused on this dream. When we first started the tools, we had a dream about starting a revolution in education, according to Sir Ken Robinson, who's going to be here. As a Brazilian poet once said, a dream that you dream alone is nothing but a dream. But a dream that you dream together becomes reality. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah, question. And there's a microphone. And maybe I can give you this. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Oh, now. So, uh, can you give us more details about your business model and how do you monetize and, uh, and so on? Sorry, didn't. Give uh, more details about your business model. Okay. How do you monetize? All right, very so good. So, uh, basically, we, we're, we have this school's license today. Uh, it's people that open an, an English school because you're only teaching English right now. So they open an English school, and they pay the license for us. They use our platform and our brand. And from the amount the students pay, 25% comes to us. So it's like it's a license fee. And something about, uh, important about the, the business model as well, uh, we are, our, our plans to, when you come to other countries is like to license this inside uh, regular schools, like uh, formal schools, universities. They all can use our platform to teach languages. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, what is your target mar market at the moment? Could be any school or language schools, public schools, private schools. Um, it's a range. I mean. Okay. Uh, well, our market, uh, as I said, it's any. For, uh, formal schools or universities that can teach, that wants to teach languages, uh, we've been asked a lot if you can use our platform, our method, our system to teach other things like geography or math or whatever. And actually, we do. We we have plans for that. Uh, we have in our our group some experts in some other areas, and we're they're running tests uh, in geography, for example. But uh, for right now, it's like only language. Where, as I told you, we're teaching English, but we can we have our platform ready to take it to any other language. Did answer your question. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. that's it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our next team has AI tools for customized training and learning based on not only your previous knowledge, but what you're going through in your life today. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Capa Ball from Spain. Thank you. OK, hello, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Marta, and I'm co-founder of Capable. I don't know how many of you will agree with me that there is an increasing gap between the academic world and the professional world. In fact, 90% of top executives of companies believe that university students do not come enough well prepared for the labor market after finishing their studies. On the other hand, we live in the automation era, where it is believed that near 375 million people might, for, might be forced to change profession in the next 20, 30 years. All this together might be seen as a threat, but in Capable, we believe it's an opportunity, the opportunity to change the way we adapt and we confront uh, this digital uh, revolution. And in fact, numbers like the one shown by Tecnavio uh, tell us that the opportunity is on the personalized uh, e-learning uh, market. That's why nine months ago, we created Capable an artificial intelligence platform that creates completely personalized learning plans for our users. And we create these plans not by creating content ourselves, but taking the content from the online uh, existing ones, high quality always. Capable helps companies improve critical KPIs, but it's also useful for young people that are not finding what they are looking for in the academic offer, and also for professionals that have realized that the, um, they need to recycle. How does it work? Easy. You enter Capable and you answer a brief uh, skills and level test that helps our algorithm 
work for you, searching the, the content and curating it for you. Every time you consume one content of a learning path, let's say blockchain, we ask for feedback so that the internal curation is always fulfilled. Plus, we have gamification and follow-up tools in order to maintain motivation levels up. Our business model for both companies and individuals is based on a monthly subscription fee, less than 10 euros per month per user. And right now, we have the trust of B2B paying customers summing up to 200 licenses. And we have recently closed a partnership agreement with K2 Partnery Solutions. Founding team is composed by Sixto, Jose, and myself. Sixto and Jose are serial entrepreneurs with exit cases like Mobilisto and Application, respectively. And myself, I have been running an innovation agency during the last four years. We have a super team of six more people, and together we have reached several milestones during the last nine months. In between, we have a first round of 180K with investors like Javier Galloso, former CEO of Spotify Iberia, or Marieta del Rivero, former global CMO of Telefonica. This round served us to build the technology to an MVP stage and to hire the first uh, team. But now we are seeking 250K in order to open the B2C market in Spanish-speaking countries, Spain, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, and Argentina, and of course, to improve the level of autonomy of our algorithm. That's all. Thank you very much, and happy to visit you in booth uh, 101. Thank you. OK. Thank you. There's no, no, no questions. OK. Very good. All right. Our next startup, I mean, imagine if you could learn by creating your own quizzes. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, this is what these people are trying to do. And if you did it this way, you could actually maybe teach your friends. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Cerebrit Technologies. Hello, my name is Raul Orejas, and I am the founder of Celebrity, uh, the playful learning content created by students and for students. We believe education should be fun and creative, and that isn't happening today. The education system is strangling creativity and motivation in schools. They are turning schools into creativity killers, and they are turning students into bored and demotivated zombies that don't find any purpose in going to school. In fact, only in Spain, 20% of our students will be dropping out from schools, will be dropping out from schools before finishing it because they'll get bored. That's why we've created Celebrity, because we want to bring back motivation and creativity in schools. And how do we do it? Well, Therapy engages students by enabling them to create their own learning content through games. Because when a student creates their own game, they are taking ownership of the content they are learning. And also, they are becoming teachers of their classmates. And they're having fun because they're playing games, and they're training their creative school skills that are so important for the future. What we do, what we have, is a, is a software, a game creation software that allows students to create, any, to turn any content into a learning game in two minutes and without coding. So the idea is that the students themselves create those games and share them with their classmates. Those games are uploaded in our game catalog that are for any age, any subject, and any language. And we have already 100,000 games which make us the largest learning game catalog in Spanish. Also, we have gamification dynamics to involve students in the subject, such as points, leaderboards, or badges. And we also have tools for teachers, so they can keep track on their students' evolution. Our methodology is being proven by teachers that not only say that students improve creativity and improve motivation, but they also improve their results. In fact, Scientific evidence shows that in every subject where therapy is being used, the results improve um, substantially. Our traction, we have already 750,000 users every month, and we aim to reach 1.5 million by the end of the school year. 
Our growth is exponential, 15% month over month, with 70% of our users in Latin America, and we've reached all this with no cost in marketing. Our um, business model is a social business model because we believe education should be fun, collaborative, and accessible to everyone. But this is sustained by three business models based on um, licenses for schools, uh, uh, specific solutions for corporates, and we're launching this month an app for parents, which is a freemium app for uh, B2C. Our team is, uh, has 50 years of experience in creativity, economics, and technology. And uh, so we put all this together to improve education and bring back creativity and motivation to schools. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Our next startup is turning graduate education into online education. And they're actually working with some of the top universities in the world. From Spain, join me in welcoming Global Alumni. My name is Pablo Rivas, and I'm the founder of Global Alumni, an EdTech startup with 3,000 graduate students already and operating in 15 different countries. Everything has changed. You can ask any of the investors of these companies, and they will tell you that everything has changed. But what about education? I finished my MBA at the ESSE back in 2014, and it was a great school, great professors. But the thing is that I realized that we haven't changed anything for the last 2,000 years. It's the same way, the same method. So something is changing, you know? And we are talking a lot about e-learning. But e-learning is not a PDF, it's not videos online, and it's not about reaching a massive audience around the world. E-learning is much more than that. This is just the first wave. E-learning is, e is about IE, it's about virtual reality, it's about customization, and at the end of the day, what it's about is about changing our mindsets. And that's what we are doing in Global Alumni. We are innovating in every phase of the process within universities. In life, there are thinkers and there are doers. And we are doers. When we started the company four years ago, they said, Pablo, you are not going to be able to break down barriers, language barriers, from the top universities in the world. And we did it. We have 3,000 students right now from the top main business schools from the world. So we are doers, and we are trying to combine the best online, the technology, with the offline, with the tradition, with the prestige. And in Global Alumni, we provide four services for universities. We provide advisory service. We provide high content creation. We provide marketing recruitment services. And we provide, well, we'll help them on the delivery process. So it's a turnkey solutions for universities. And who do we work with? We work with the best universities in the world. We work with UCLA, we work with Berkeley, we work with MIT Professional Education, and we work with Asada Business School. Because we think that the, these top 10 universities that we are about to reach in 2020, those ones are the ones who are going to lead the change on education. Because the fourth revolution is already here. On the first one, on the second one, and on the third one, anything changed at all, on education, but on the fourth one, education is going to change. It's not going to change by itself. Education is going to change because of the result of five different things. Thinkers, doers, investment, of course, technology, and beside that, people, persons. Persons like the team at Global Alumni, that we wake up every day trying to transform higher education. Our model is excellence or nothing. Excellence on rewriting education, or we believe nothing will change. Thank you. No question. No question. All right, moving along here. The uh, next startup. I mean, can you imagine teaching your two-year-old kid a foreign language? 
Well, this is, this is what these people are doing. They're actually teaching English to foreign kids ages two to eight. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming from Spain, Lingo Kids. Thank you very much. Perfect. Hi, I'm Ashley Samay. I'm director of product at Lingo Kids, the language learning platform for kids ages two to eight. Now, half a billion kids will be learning English by the year 2020. But unfortunately, traditional methods are expensive, they're time consuming for parents, and quite frankly, due to geographical or financial barriers, or both, many parents don't have access to high quality content. At Linko Kids, we're changing that. Our mission is to break down education barriers and provide equal opportunities to kids around the world. Now we're focused on English language learning and we're specifically designed and developed to make activities as fun and engaging as possible for young learners. So in our product, we take kids through a series of fun activities, songs, games, writing exercises that adapt in level of difficulty to each child. We differentiate ourselves in the market because we are self-directed, we are personalized, and we are immersive. That means that for each child, their experience in Lingo Kids is unique. So if they love colors or if they love animals, we actually adapt that experience and make it harder if they get it right or easier if they get it wrong. Now, parents in the audience, we care about you too. So we empower parents and educators through guides, through progress reports, and printable activities for use at home. Our business model is a subscription model, so members pay a monthly fee for unlimited access to our content. 90% of our subscriptions are annual, and by controlling our cost of acquisition, we have a direct ROI. Now, as I mentioned, true to our, our mission, we really care about providing opportunities for all kids. So we offer a free version as well with limited activities. We've had great traction. We're a global company in 180 countries. We're focused on USA, LATAM, and Southeast Asia. And our model is backed by strong financial performance. We've grown 300% and across all of our key metrics, sales, customers, families. We reached over 5 million in ARR this year and 7 million registered families. Since launching in 2016, we've hit important milestones. We've raised over 10 million, some of which we just announced yesterday, which we're very excited about. Um, we've reached a over 40 person headcount. And it is the team uh, that I'm most proud of. We have a stellar exec team. We're led by our founder, Cristobal, who was head of platform at Vicky that had a 200 million exit. Our VP of Education, Suzanne Barchers, was on the board at PBS Kids, YouTube Kids, and now leads the Board of Education for Lingo Kids. Now, I want to wrap up with what is most important to us, and that's actually that the kids love us. We hear from parents and children like Adi every day about how we are changing the lives of millions of families and giving them opportunities they wouldn't have without Lingo Kids. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, for the jury, um, we're not having my ABC kit, so uh, remove that one. And we're gonna go straight to the next one. Uh, this company is about intelligent digital content. Now, we all know everything's going digital, but imagine if you could have intelligent digital content that helps you match your profile to an organization. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Odilo from Spain. Thank you. Education inequality is a global phenomenon and a high priority item for lots of politicians worldwide. Only a marginal improvement will have a billion dollar impact on the global economy. That's why at Odillo, we're looking to address inequality in general by making reading more accessible and more affordable to everyone. That's why we're working, for example, with the European Commission and alongside lots of ministries of education and culture in many different markets. How do we deliver on this mission? By offering intelligent digital libraries 
on a B2B basis to both public libraries as well as educational organizations, which in turn offer it for free to their communities. Why are we intelligent in our solutions? One, because it's fully personalized end-to-end -end web and mobile. Two, our content collections are fully customized for each customer, curriculum and non-curriculum. Three, we support multimedia. Four, the, uh, we offer a Netflix-style user experience. And, and lastly, we offer reading comprehension and social learning capabilities that help maximize the reading experience. On top of this, we support lots of different content models out there, from the classic perpetuity model to the more flexible pay-per-use model, so our customers can make the most of their content budgets. Currently, we distribute 1.4 million titles from 3,000 publishers worldwide. We've been awarded multi-year contracts with ministries of education and culture and the likes from many, many countries, which grant us access to over 140 million users worldwide. We also have strategic resellers that are helping us get, get great traction, for example, Ingram in the US. All this is really interesting, but honestly, we feel like we're in the beginning of our journey. Our business model is scalable because actually our revenues increase with every customer. Why? Because we, with, we get more revenues with more checkout um, activity as well as more content activity. Um, our retention rates are near 100% and our content and technology margins are high and are ever increasing with scale. We believe we have an unrivaled team with deep experience in both the telecom, the publishing, the library and the ad tech space. Our, our vision is to ultimately aggregate content of all types, of all languages from all over the world and unify it all in one platform, as well as continue to support more and more content license models to give our customers lots of choice, as well as we'll continue to invest in AI and data-powered services so that we ultimately will offer the world's largest intelligent digital content marketplace. Odilo, making reading affordable and accessible to everyone. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this next company, I think you might see it says USA. Well, it's not a US company. It's actually an Israeli company. Everybody says Silicon Valley because that's where they raise money. In any case, what these people are doing is really amazing. You know, the idea of large-scale, personalized education is like everyone's dream. Well, with AI, you can actually do it. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming from Israel the startup Sense. Thank you. Thank you. Hola. We make sense. Our passion is scalable education. CS Everywhere and STEM Everywhere is a movement worldwide. The world recognizes the need for more scientists, for more engineers. But the revolution of scalable education cannot happen before we solve a very fundamental core problem. Let me give you an example from Harvard University course called CS50, where they have 100,000 students online each year. They give them amazing video lectures. It's like a blockbuster movie. But actually, learning is not like entertainment. It's not one way. It's not just content delivery. Because students, especially in STEM, they need to do assignments, especially open-ended assignments. And therefore, teachers need to review the assignments of every student and give them feedback. Now, Harvard and other schools understood that. So they opened a dedicated track, as like you can see here at the right, that costs more. So for $2,200, your assignments get graded and evaluated by teaching fellows, by human teaching fellows, and not just auto-graded for $90. But unfortunately, they could not scale that to more than 200 students. And that's bad, because we cannot scale a process without scaling all its components. So we cannot scale education without scaling also the part of open-ended assignments and feedback. So this is what Sense solve in a very unique hybrid AI approach. It begins by taking all the submissions, all the answers for a certain question, translating it into virtual DNA sequences. Why? 
because then we can use the best science in the world for analyzing such heterogeneous data, which is the science of genomics. Ma ma many machine learning algorithms that were proven and optimized to find patterns in such kind of data set. So we find patterns in students' answers. So maybe you begin with 1,000 students, 1,000 answers, but actually there are just like three or five species of, uh, of solution types. And what's remaining for the human educator now is to review and analyze each cluster and feedback each cluster and not each uh, assignment individually. So if teaching before looked like that, reviewing tons of assignments, it took a lot of time and done in random order, now it's being organized and done easily in a scalable manner. And for students, if learning before was just receiving feedback that is shallow, like a B, now it is done in a more comprehensive way, 24-7, whenever the student needs some help. And the questions are the same, before and after. So Teachers don't need to come up with new questions. Everyone benefits, students, instructors, and administrators. And this is when you can sell. And Sense is applicable all around the world because assessment and feedback are needed all around the world. But it's unique in the market, um, in the market not like other workarounds, like multiple choice questions and uh, adaptive uh, courseware, where it's very specific. We do it in a scalable manner with good academic outcomes. The company works with major universities in the US and in Israel. We have a, a, a big office in the US, in Manhattan. Uh, we raised seed, uh, we were part of Y Combinator, and we raised more money from VCs and investors. Now we are raising Series A. It is led by the CEO, Seth Haberman. He is a senior, a very serious uh, manager, was a senior vice president at Comcast. I bring the, P uh, the AI part, I have PhD in that. I'm a lecturer at many schools. Akiba was an uh, associate dean at Harvard. Now he works at Sense, and Karen built amazing products in the high-tech space. So, to conclude, now with Sense, education just got deep, just got responsive, personal, 24-7, and scalable. Well, education just got Sense. Thank you very much. Amazing stuff. All right. Most of you probably know that AI is everything right now, but the reality is that most people in companies are not capturing a lot of data, and they don't think data. So this next startup is actually using an online training tool to help people relate to data for corporate clients. Ladies and gentlemen from Germany, join me in welcoming Stack Fuel. Thanks. That's not us, so I need another presentation. <laughs> Do you want to switch? Okay, here we go. So welcome from my side. My name is Leo. I'm the co-founder and CEO of StackView. We are from Berlin. And we have developed an online training platform for data analytics. So that means we help corporates and their employees to master data analytics, data engineering, and data science. But let's quickly talk about jobs in the future. They will change rapidly. So more and more people need to work in robotics, self-driving cars, AI, and data analytics. And the underlying trend on all of that is data, also big data. But the problem is here that there are not many people on the market who are able or who have those skills. So if we look at the market, there's over 2.7 million open positions in the US alone, which won't be filled until 2020. Same goes for Europe and worldwide, we are facing a so shortage of over 10 million people who are able to work with data. So companies have a real problem. 
And here's the solution. The solution is that companies have to train their existing talent. We have developed an online learning platform which is focused on employers. We only focus on data analytics, so we don't do any other topics. And we always promise to make the people job ready. How do we do that? We have developed four different training programs. Data awareness, which is for all non-technical employees who should just understand the topic. And then the in-depth topics, data analyst, data engineer, and data scientist. And here, this is a three to four month program where you learn all, all the necessary skills to work in these jobs or just to get started. What's important to know, our training is just 10% theory and 90% practical learning. What does that mean? Here on the left-hand side, you see our learn management system where you can watch videos, uh, screen texts, make quizzes, so the things that you might know from other platforms. But on the right-hand side, uh, you see our data lab. And this data lab is the heart of our solution. It gives the learner all what he needs to run data analytics. So that's the data itself, it's the coding infrastructure, and it's the computing power. And if you have any questions, you can contact our uh, support all the time, and you get an answer within under five minutes. To sum it up, we are B2B focused. You do the training on the job. Uh, the training goes four to six hours per week, so that's the workload for the employee, and we work with real industry data sets that the training makes sense for the job. That's our team. We are 10 people based in Berlin. We won quite a few awards. Most recently, we were named the most innovative training solution in Europe. And we don't only win awards, we also win clients. Telefonica is our biggest client so far, but we also work with other big clients like Daimler, BMW, and other financial institutions in Germany. We are moving into the inter international market now, to London and to Madrid. And I would be happy to get your votes, and I'm more than happy to answer your questions afterwards. Thank you very much. All right. Now, last but not least, this is our last startup. Now, if there are any of you that are here today that are professors, you know that it's usual in a class of 56 students that some of them are going to get left behind. And it's very difficult to know whether the guys in the back are actually learning. Well, imagine if you had an AI tool that not only helped you with planning and scheduling, but actually told you who was learning and who wasn't. Well, that's what these people do. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Republic of Chile, you planner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon for everyone. Um, my name is Juan Pablo. I'm the CEO of the Planner. We are solving three big problems in Latin America. Dropout, coverage, and quality. Quality in learning experience or a faculty. What is Planner? It's a software based on mathematical algorithms and artificial intelligence for data analysis for higher education institutions. We add value, uh, adding new resources to the strategic plan, and measuring the, the main indicators of quality. We have seven platforms for management and scheduling, student success, and learning experience. Our main competitors charge five times uh, more, but do not have our entire offer. The principal milestones, we, we, we have six years of history. Um, the last three years, we, are opened, uh, we, we opened uh, offices in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and US, and others. And the last month, we closed uh, the, our Series A for five million, ready to scale. Um, we have 62 universities in 12 countries, the best universities in US ranking, or the biggest uh, in, in each country. Our business model is five dollars per student per year per product. Um, the average ticket is 100,000 dollars per product per year. We're growing a, a double last, uh, last two years. And this year, we are, we are selling uh, 5 million. 
but not, our, not, not only the university benefit of our um, solutions, uh, also governments, with, because they, they have more professionals, students, where, because they have a, a better ex student experience, and partners with uh, co-selling and co-marketing. The market is huge, but our focus is 7,000 uh, universities in the world. Our team is very high level uh, in, in, in education management, in algorithms, and, and, and in, sell, in, in sales. You plan our teams, we are, we are 62 people, plus 20 uh, developers in India. This is, uh, this is one of our uh, case of uh, success, success, uh, uh, ex, um, the success uh, case. Um, this university in Mexico are saving a million of dollars uh, per year. The last year we, we won this award, the best company in innovation worldwide by Microsoft. Um, we want to transform the education in a, a high performance education. Thank you very much. Okay, well, the good news is that because we had a no-show, we have moved up one of the finalists. So we have one more for today. And thank God we do, because these people are doing something and it's truly relevant. Now, we all know that there's a bit of a disconnect between universities and companies. But what these people have done is made every student project as relevant as possible to society, to the companies, working with universities, so they're making university work relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, I could say from Colombia, but this is even more special. From Medellin, join me in welcoming Interactpedia. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hola. Interactpedia. In, oh, OK. In the world, there are more than 1.4 billion students that are actually living an educational model that has not evolved in more than 200 years. Disconnecting from reality based on hypothetical cases and adapting to a reality in based on grades. In Interactpedia, we develop a new experiential collaborative learning model based on real challenges. People, I know that technology is really important in education that we are changing education from the bottom, from the basics, the role of the professor, how they actually students connect with their purpose and everything else. It's, we develop a new co-creation platform that works like, similar to an Airbnb. And we connect research groups and courses with all the problems of the world, making students' projects actually generate real value in society. So in uh, more than two years, we've had connected thousands of students with thousands of challenges from organizations all over the world. That's our impact. But in, in particular, our impact is how we can create entrepreneurs in a massive scale, how we can connect with other organizations and create new jobs. We have presented a solution for all kinds of topics, more than 600 companies in every topic. And we can achieve this in every course all over the world, in every university. And this is how it works. It works like an Airbnb, Airbnb Uber with university courses. We develop a co-creation platform that helps with all this the process. Here, I'm going to show you some really quick examples of, of our technology. These are all the methodologies and tools. This is how we discover challenges, that how students actually connect during the workshops, how they can co-create during the process with organizations, how they manage their teams in real time, how they have feedback in real time in audio and video, how we can create new dynamic projects formats to connect with the community, how we can analyze big data for all the process in the middle, how we share moment stories, because this has to be fun, and how we, we manage ideas and be creative all the time, collaborative evaluation from all the stakeholders, how we connect with global stakeholder mentors all over the world, uh, real networking inside classes, projected profiles with new algorithms, achievement with gamification, community logics and content, new network understanding talent. A uh, business model is like we, we got to a key point in six months, and this year we are going to get 300K. 
And this, if we even invent a new business model for university, we, sh we have shared more than $100,000 with, with professional students. We have a huge opportunity in markets all over the world. This is only in Colombia. We have projected revenue of $16 million in the next two, three years. And this is our competition. We are the middle, actually, on, of the educational system. Uh, this is only a lot of awards and recognition. We're supposed to be, to be one of the uh, persons that's going to change the world. And this is our team. We are going to scale up. I, I have no time. I, we want to actually create education like in the movies. That's what we want to do. Thank you. I told you Medellin was special. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the moment that uh, we've been waiting for. We have four prizes that we're going to announce today. What I'm going to do is call up first the person that's going to announce and award the prize. As I said earlier, the first prize is going to be a social impact prize. Second prize will be the Best Technology Award, and the third will be the Startup Higher Education Award. So, for the Social Impact Prize, I would like to call up Jose Maria Sanz Magallon, Telefonica Foundation General Manager. Okay, so what I'm supposed to do, just to announce the gonna, win? Uh, oh. Maybe you can say a few words. Yeah, sure, this absolutely, prize. absolutely. This is, uh, so it was, uh, well, thank you very much, and thank you to all the startups. It was really difficult because, uh, as I think our chairman said, we believe that all what we do in education is having a social impact, actually a social impact. So it was very hard for us to, to make a decision. Nevertheless, we had to pick a startup and uh, we think that, you know, uh, Lingo Kids, that is helping millions of children to learn languages is, you know, one of the startups that is really achieving a huge social impact. So congratulations to Lingo Kids. And, uh, congratulations. Uh, but it's a uh, recognition. We're really happy and we hope that you are still successful. Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, and now for the Best Technology Award. This one will be given by Carolina Jo, CEO of Telefónica Educación Digital, and Andrés Saborido, the Wire Spain Manager. And the winner is Sense. Woo. Sense. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You have a great product. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and now for the final award before we get to the award of the jury. This is for the Startup Award for Higher Education, and it will be given out by Lucia Figar, Chairwoman of IE Rockets, and Juan Jose Guemes, Chairman of IE Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. Thank you, everybody. As you know, uh, uh, 
IE University has to give the prize for the uh, best startup in the higher ed segment. Uh, there was a lot of competition, but actually we had in that segment three finalists here, uh, and being a very hard ch choice, I will let Juanjo say the name. <laughs> what is the winner? Ah, and the winner is you Planet. Okay, and now for the moment that we've all been waiting for. The winner of this first edition of Enlighted. As I said earlier, over 16, I'm sorry, over 600 startups from all over the world competing for this prize. 210 were picked initially, and then we had 18 finalists here in Madrid today. And now we have our winner, and who better to give that award than the person that represents the body and soul of the South Summit, Maria Benjumea. Thank you, Paris. And the winner, the winner, who will be the winner? The winner is Ronen from Sense. Where is Ronen? Lucia, come up here. Yes, can can all the prize givers please come up? Juanjo, come on up. Come on up. Al revés, uh, the other way around. Ah, hombre. Paris was the winner of Tel Aviv Venture Day. Exactly. Oh, amazing. Winner of Tel Aviv Venture Day as well. Okay, so uh, before we go, can we give a big applause to Telefonica, our partner for this amazing event? Woo. And also to Lucia Figar for organizing this whole event. Hey, yeah.